Ross and call me cowgirl because it's time for another rage like <laughs> a rip roaring rage slut. Rip roaring rootin' tootin' <laughs> son of a gun. I'm an old time prospector. I actually did that gag on something else. I don't know if it was a podcast or a video or whatever, but I, I started an old timey voice so i can't you know how hard it is after four years to think of something new that i ain't already done <laughs> sometimes when i need a thing to start the patreon email with i go onto the internet and you can literally type in there's like a web page that you can do a thing that says like and it's just random things yeah and i'll just get like a 50 pictures of random things and be like uh Why don't milkshakes you just go That's on like do. twitter and just find the like uh oh, what's trending yeah the trending thing because it all just be like weird trump jokes be or like, whatever what's up <laughs> party people ready to dab on our fidget spinners <laughs> like, right. you sound like somebody's like ill-informed father <laughs> yep yep uh but hey it's time for another rage like podcast and it Yay. is the last podcast before e3 and i'm jeff i'm amanda and next week um I haven't figured out how it's going to work yet, but traditionally during E3, John and I record Every everything. Day, yeah, just ever, just hours. And I think last year I counted it up, and it was something like eight or nine hours worth of podcast. We call that the dead E3. time between me and John. I, you know, I think that th- <laughs> I think that what two years ago uh-huh. E3 was when you were finally like, you know what, I can't, I can't. It was like right after that whole barrage where you came to me and you were just like, yeah. no more, Jeff. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, I've had enough of your shit. I had too much of your shenanigans, Jeff. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, hey, this week we've got a bunch of news stories. A bunch of pre E three stuff, um, but before we go into that, you know how I don't do anything, Amanda. Yeah, you know how I just sit in my house and drink beer and play video games and drink beer and then watch Netflix and then drink beer. This is already an exciting story. <laughs> sure. <laughs> what did you do? Well, guess what I did last week. Uh, Take a guess. Take a wild a guess. Killed a man. I no. You're close though. You're in the right ballpark. <laughs> you yeah. Shot a dog. <laughs> <laughs> don't would... ask me to guess. Why is this? <laughs> Why would I do such a thing? I don't know. Why? I and just it seemed like something. I'll give you one. I'll give you one more chance. It didn't involve me harming anything, but it did involve death. It, oh God, Jesus! Did you win the against death? Uh, some kind of fiddling match? Yes, um, death and I. <laughs> we fidget spun. Did you, and, did you yes. win a fiddle of gold? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, I, I beat the devil in Dark Souls Three <laughs> PvP, and uh, I got to keep my soul, and I got a solid gold fiddle. <laughs> he was like, "This game is too hard." That's right. <laughs> um, no, I went to a séance. What? Yes. Did you like? Did an old passed away grandmother uh, contact you? <laughs> was it? Like, are you did asking, she like ring a bell or? Are you asking, they, oh, I thought you were asking if it was like somebody was like, this house belongs to you now, but you just spent <laughs> one night overnight. Well, you have to do a séance. No, right here. I, it was a thing that the uh, that my my lady friend uh, basically was like, hey, this sounds fun. Let's go do this. And I was like, okay. So it was down at this place here in Austin. Apparently, these guys like it's like ten bucks and you go and um they they do a little seance they talk about like the history of seancing and then they do a a literal seance so bullshit oh oh yes (laughs) yes 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 okay so (laughs) they look straight at you and they're like i'm thinking of a g name a g g g g no no (laughs) no no you're not far off with that (laughs) the problem the problem with a seance in today's day and age is that we are too well informed about the tricks that seances use it use uh so they started off actually kind of interestingly by just talking about like the history of of um uh, like uh, a cult stuff? Yeah, a cult, like spirit talking and stuff like that. Yeah. And by the way, I, I would like to make this perfectly clear. If you believe in that stuff, I don't necessarily, I don't really believe in it, but I've never been one to just be like, uh, and I need to make sure that you don't believe in it either because, yeah. bah, like, if you just don't believe in that. This particular experience you had was not, clearly not a legitimate thing. Right. Like, so they talked They talked about the history of, of mediums and spiritualism and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They put a real big a real big anti Houdini spin on it, you know, like, Oh, that guy didn't know what the fuck he was. I don't know if you know this, but Harry Houdini was like a, he was like a, um, a debunker of the, the paranormal. Really? Did you know this? Like, I, mean, I feel like I should know that. He had a standing it... thing where it's like, he would give anybody a hundred thousand dollars who could prove that they could actually talk to the dead. And then he would like go to seances and be like, uh, this you got a you, table yeah. rigged. There's a guy in that closet yeah. and this is what's going on. Um, but they started by, uh, having everybody, 
meditate, which gets you in a real open, relaxed frame of mind. They did this whole thing where they're like, we don't know a lot about spirits. So like if you if your leg tingles or if you feel you got to tell us if you if yeah. you if a, if a number comes into your head, you got to say something because this could be the spirit realm. I have a number in my head. What is it? Sixty nine. Oh, damn it. We all had that number <laughs> in our head all the time. <laughs> Um, but what was really great about it was that they had... <laughs> I just like to think the guys would be like, if you're not going to take this seriously, <laughs> we'll give you your $10 back. <laughs> I just sat there grinning. I was not about to say anything. But yeah. like what the greatest part of it was before they started, they were like, now we've got a lot of... Uh, We've got a lot of, of things in place to protect us from evil specters and things coming, spooks and spirits and, and things. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, anybody who doesn't feel comfortable, like, we're getting ready to get started, so now you should probably leave. And the guy that was sitting right next to me just stood up and he was like, I'm going to go. And I was just wow. like, all right, all right. Nice. You know, this is the guy that's going to survive a horror movie. Yeah, he's like, you know what? <laughs> I'm not going to fuck with it. All us white people are like, nah, let's contact the devil. <laughs> I, I want to talk Bring to Bring a Ouija this. board. How am I going to die? Is it right now? Is this how I'm going to die? Yeah. I've seen enough horror movies to know that I'm going to be the first one. But <laughs> but they literally, have you ever seen the thing with the flashlight? Yeah. Where it, they like unscrew it yeah. so that like it's not on mm -hmm. and then it like they tap it. Like, it well, the, no, it, they don't tap it. It's well, just, the implication is that the ghost is going to tap it or so like create what, power. If you watch some, if you watch these guys carefully, what they did is they'll have a flashlight that screws. When you turn the screw, it turns it on, turns it off. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they actually take those flashlights and they, they turn them on and they put them on the table. And all the guy was doing his whole shtick, they're on and what's happening is they're heating up. And then when they, what they do is they twist them so they're just right barely off and then they put them down what happens mm -hmm. is that as they cool, eventually the metal contracts and it makes a connection back to where it was yeah. and it comes back on. And then as it heats up, it'll go back off again. And so what they do is they set up a whole bunch of them and they're like, spirits, are you here? And they just say, are you here? Like until one of the lights turns Finally off or it, yeah. turns on. And then they're like, ah, you know, and then they <laughs> were like. They just used this. They also had a, a radio. They're like, oh, did you hear the static? There's static on the radio. And it's like, bro, it's a storm outside. Like, you've got it tuned to static. <laughs> yeah, you like, uh, didn't you tell me that you went during, like, the thunderstorms that were going on? Because um, mm -hmm. we had, like, a couple, like, three days of, like, bad rain and thunderstorms. Yeah, they were, it was a real downpour Which, while we were oh doing Oh, my it. God, that sounds like it'd be even better. Yeah. Where he's like, ghost, contact us now. And you just, yeah. <laughs> like, thunder in the background. But, no, and then it, and then it just devolved into, like, so when they finally got the lights going, then mm -hmm. it became this, like, is it this side of the room, spirit? Is it this side of the? Is it this side of the room? Is it this side of the room? Is it this row? And then they would they picked a person finally, and they were like, okay, now just stand up, just start saying letters out. And then like when one of the lights would do something, they'd be like, oh F F, it's it's F, and it's and it's funny because they came up with these <laughs> two F letters, and it's you, yes, um... right? <laughs> and then and they had two letters, and they were actually my grandpa's initials, and they were like, does this mean anything to anybody? And I'm just like, yeah, it means this thing is bullshit. That's coincidence. Those letters could mean anything to anybody. Anybody. Meanwhile, I ain't saying <laughs> shit. Meanwhile, your grandpa's in the afterlife like, Jeff, talk to me. My damn it, Grandpa. You know that I don't fall for this shit. <laughs> I gave you a book of Eastern like Eastern philosophy on your birthday. <laughs> you know that I ain't all about the occult. <laughs> anyway, it was fun. It lasted about an hour. Yeah. I, I mean, pee the entire time. Oh, man. So the spirits were really not with me. <laughs> the spirits were like, this guy seems really uncomfortable. Because I just wanted to be like, I'm sorry. I don't mean to break your, uh, your protection spell, but I'm going <laughs> to fucking wet myself if i don't get outside <laughs> you should have wet yourself and been like the ghost oh, the spirit peed my pants how did that happen it's an ectoplasm do you want to collect it right. <laughs> yeah, and then they had a candle they had a candle where um you know the candle would flicker they had a, but they had an overhead fan on in the shed that That's we were in that was amazing. doing amazing i would have so. loved for you to like tell them like wouldn't the overhead fan affect it no. oh that's a different flicker <sighs> no see here's the thing is that i unfortunately know a whole uh, a boatload of this because jason like went through all this stuff the debunking stuff mm -hmm. and like doesn't really believe in the paranormal he's fascinated by the iconography and stuff like that but yeah. doesn't really believe in like ghosts or anything so he's told me how all this shit works and then you could see it even more they dimmed the lights. Mm -hmm. There was just a candle. They had everybody meditate ahead of time. They had a whole bunch of people who didn't know each other in a room. Do you know how hard it is 
to speak up and 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 say like this is bullshit yeah. like when you especially if you've paid to go to the thing right like you want it's fucking fox boulder man i want to believe I, I so i feel like i know enough people that are assholes that, yeah. that would be like this seems like bullshit <laughs> i paid ten dollars to let you know that this is bullshit i think i really confused the guy because they were like has anybody ever had an experience that they can't uh, explain it. I raise my hand and they're like, and who believes in the paranormal? And I put my hand down and it's just <laughs> like, I don't know, man. I'm a big believer. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, but it was fun. It was fine. And I, again, at the end of this, I do want to reiterate, if you believe in that stuff, that's great. Dude, that's, I'm totally a believer. I just don't, I just think that those practices don't work. I mean, as near as I can tell, like, there's so many things about, like, the human mind wants to find patterns where the patterns don't exist. Yeah. We know a lot about psychology. Like, if you really want to, like, do this paranormal thing, go get a candle, put the candle in a darkened room, and just sit at a table, breathe steadily, and stare into the candle, and think about a thing, and chances are that your brain will eventually take your places, right? I mean, shit, if you're in a dark room for long enough, your mind will start creating figures in the room, and you can have a paranormal experience without anything paranormal actually happening. sensory deprivation tank. You'll start tripping balls. Oh, yeah. Fucking the modern rogue, they just did the the, the whole sensory deprivation. Like, it's a homemade sensory deprivation thing where you're just blocking out, like, stuff, and you're covering up your eyes, and then you just lay in a perfectly, like, zero it's basically you just when you deprive yourself of stimulus mm-hmm. your brain just starts going fucking nuts and yeah, like yeah. doing all kinds of stuff isn't it like it, you can if you do that in like the proper way you can actually create essentially what like a mushroom trip is i don't essentially believe that because i've been in on mushroom trips but i don't know there's a modern rogue episode about it as all i'm like I don't know. Let's just keep promoting Modern Rogue. <laughs> all I think gonna, it was Modern Rogue. No Fuck, shade at all. Oh, shit. But I don't believe that Brian Brushwood or Jason Murphy have as much experience with psychedelic substances I as I do. Well, so. I don't think it would be anything like doing drugs, but you're definitely like a hallucination thing. Yes. So. Yep. I mean, uh, there was a story I always loved. Like that Microsoft has a room where they tested the Kinect. It's uh-huh. like a completely sound baffled room. Like it's got so much baffling in it that you can go in there and talk and you can barely hear it because the room is designed to make things quiet. They said that if you go in there, people can't stand being in there because just without sound, you start to all you can hear is your heart and it starts to become this thunderously loud yeah. sound because your brain has literally nothing else to think about. So whatever. I think it's interesting. It was a fun experience. I got a thing to talk about. Yeah. Great. Because nobody cares about my chickens. I, so. I didn't talk <laughs> I didn't talk to the dead or anything. Did not at all? No. Not I even once? I didn't even try. You ever just talk to your grandpa in the in the thing? You just like Nah. Okay. I did, I dug dug him up and was like grandpa and they're like that's not how you do this. <laughs> that's <laughs> generally speaking, <laughs> Miss Arias, we don't dig up the dead. <laughs> That's more of a reanimator than a seance. Yeah, let's do that. The reanimator thing. Yeah. You just, I just Combs. watched Young Frankenstein again. Mm-hmm. I could let's do that. Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm for it. Yeah. You got a corpse. You yeah. got a science man. I always do, man. There's corpses all over the place. I don't know. I don't have a science person, so maybe that's the next Modern Rogue episode. Let's <laughs> How do we reanimate the dead? Let's just get a dead crab and bring it back to life. Crabenstein. It'll, Crabenstein's <laughs> monster. Crabenstein was actually the doctor. Uh, You're referring to geez. Crabenstein's monster. <laughs> All right, well, enough of that foolishness. Um, How about a whole different type of foolishness? Okay, let's do it. Video game news. Um, Our first story this week is sad. Uh It's very sad. Why is it sad? Because Hideo Kojima said that they're not bringing Death Stranding to E3. What if he's lying to you? Uh, Then I'm happy again (laughs) and have a neat reason to live. so easy to please. (laughs) (laughs) There's only two game developers that I really give a fuck about, and he's one of them. Um, Is there a reason that he's not? Uh, they said, yeah, he said he on said, Twitter, fuck E3 and that's it. No, he basically said that they're just working on it. They're, they're focusing on working on the game. And a lot of people don't know this, but, um, having actually worked for a game company near E3 and actually haven't read a lot of articles about E3, um, E go, taking your game to E3 is an incredibly stressful thing mm-hmm. because like, if you're going to be showing it, like if you were going to be making a trailer, mm, Okay, you make a trailer, right? Yeah. But if you're going to be showing your game at E3 to anybody, it means you have to cut a vertical slice out of your game that may be in development and polish it to the point where if you show it to a game critic, they're not just going to be like, 
well, this isn't even remotely done. I don't know why I'm looking at this. Yeah. You have to have five minutes worth of gameplay that where you can actually do everything in the game where you can, because people are going to start evaluating your game from that moment based yeah. on what they see. So I know that a lot of studios don't like to go to E3 because well, not only that, but they have to, they have to get booth space. They have to fly a bunch of people out to be exhibitors. They have to like set up conference stuff. They have to set up appointments. It's just a very it, like invasive thing. And yeah. especially if you're mid development, that if death stranding is too early in development, they would basically have to have shifted gears like four months ago and then just or two at least two months ago and start working on a build to take to E3 that is complete enough for people to look at it. And because Death Stranding is so far out, I can see why they wouldn't do yeah. that. I mean, it just makes perfect sense. Uh, but he did uh, tweet a, a cryptic picture of a spider web um, with the word bridges underneath it. So Jeff Bridges is in it? Confirmed. Confirmed, Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges. Finally, my dreams. Yes. Uh, Jeff Bridges is also in Death Stranding. You heard it here first. 100% confirmed. Also, Half-Life 3 uh, confirmed. I'm confirming that now. I'm going to go ahead and confirm yes. it. Confirmed, yes. Uh, Bloodborne on the PC confirmed. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Xbox Ones are going to be $100 confirmed. confirmed. So Great. Well, <laughs> I hope you have money saved up for all the lawsuits. <laughs> <laughs> What's lawsuits? Hey, a guy on a podcast said a thing and it wasn't right. Come on. I feel like running a story every week that says Half-Life 3 has been confirmed just so that when it eventually happens, I'm like, booyah, kasha. You could be like the um, video game version of The Onion, oh, but yeah. instead of putting like other joke uh, blogs up, it's always... Half-Life Half 3, 3 is confirmed, confirmed yeah. just in different ways. Yep. <laughs> yep. Just every week we're going to rewrite. I'm going to make my poor news guys write the same story every week. Like, you know, make sure it's different than the last. And it's got to have like a clip, clickbaity title where it'll be like, oh, yeah, we talked to this person. You never g believe what he confirmed. Four games that you won't believe are actually coming out. <laughs> um, actually, somebody has already pointed out. So this whole like nobody knows. I, I would be surprised if there's like a word or something hidden in these little things in the web but mm -hmm. we haven't got we, we, this happened today so we haven't really gotten that far oh wait like two days ago as we're recording this podcast um but what we do know is that in the last death Stranding trailer that had guillermo del toro in it uh -huh. he was actually wearing a little pin that said bridges and then it said united cities of america and it had a web going across america so this is something to do with that obviously okay. uh, even though that's like all we know yeah <laughs> like baby well, and jar and everyone, norman Reedus. everyone's gonna like zoom in and look at every single tiny detail of the spider web and when metal gear solid 5 was called the phantom pain and they had a trailer that was just for the phantom pain yeah it had above it a bunch of like angles and that were just like they looked kind of like they were coming off of the letters from the phantom pain yeah and within like a day somebody figured out if you write metal gear solid 5 that it fits into those little angles that are above it so you know, you got to up your game if you want to trick the internet for uh, any Jesus. amount of time. Uh, yeah, that seems like a reach, though. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what else is a reach. What's a reach? Uh, Super Nintendo World. Yay. So apparently in Universal Studios. Uh, no, wait. Is that is that right? Is it Universal, Universal Studios? Universal Studios Japan. Japan? Yeah. Okay. Um, Nintendo has started work on their very own section of the theme park called Super Nintendo Land. Uh, there's a trailer, a weird, like... Family in front of a green screen trailer. Yeah, like pointing it. And look, it's Mario, everybody. And Mario's just running around. Everybody's like, yeah, Mario. All right. He's not even collecting the coins. Yeah, I oh, don't really man. know. Uh, I don't know. Is it just going to be Mario? Is it going to have, like, a bunch of other stuff? Is it going to have Zelda? Do you, do you, would you go to Super Mario... If I was in Japan, maybe, I'm, but... I was born and raised in Southern California, which is a nice way of saying uh, I was raised around Disneyland and Universal Studios. Yeah. Yes. I will go to a theme park of anything. Okay. It's part of who I am as a person. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it looks cool. I, I feel like if I ever went to Japan, I would probably try to plot out a day to go there yeah. i don't know that i would ah an authentic japanese experience <laughs> super <laughs> nintendo land well it's one of those things where it's like i'm not gonna be able to fucking go that go to this in america that's true they make like super skyrim world or super fucking some other what's it what super gears of war <laughs> land dude that'd be kind of neat just a bunch of people running around with chainsaw guns <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a good idea, and it's kind of surprising to me that Nintendo hasn't cashed in on the outside of games. I'm still 
a little bit mystified that Nintendo doesn't have more of like a direct to DVD movie presence that they don't have like why a super mario movie because mario's huge and yeah. it's, just, it's like money on the table right is that if they had to put the same well, care if that mario cartoon tells me anything not that one <laughs> <laughs> oh you're right just the super mario brothers movie nope not that one <laughs> i'm talking about japan and nintendo making a mario brothers movie well, maybe just movies to them aren't as important as they are to us because we're so Hollywood based. So yeah, like maybe. having video games, maybe having things like theme park are more If I was in if I was in Nintendo, I would call up I'd call up Disney and be like, "Hey, we we hold the rights to this world famous character. You make good movies." I wouldn't do it. You I wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Sell shit to Disney. No, I wouldn't sell it to them. I'd say a partnership or whatever. Forty percent. Yeah, like, it's almost you know. like Disney totally hasn't taken other partnerships and then found a way to fuck themselves over, fuck other people over, so that they can have their. Was there any? Was there any Nintendo stuff in Wreck It Ralph? Was Mario in there? Uh, Huber was in there. Huber is Sonic. Huber? No, was was Bowser in the? Yes, he was in the support bad guys. group. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there was been some opening there i just i it's to me again it seems like money on the table like it, it seems like mario is I arguably i just don't know if i can handle listening to mario talk for a longer period of time do you know what i mean oh what's the matter you don't want to listen to this yeah that, for 90 like, minutes oh i mean it sounds like a great idea no well less when you're doing it but it sounds like a great <laughs> idea you know just like, well why don't we make man, a super mario, mario. Luigi. Oh, no, Jesus. That's more, more of a wario boy no that's more of a waluigi man i don't know jesus whatever but you know that like when it comes out in america they'd be like why does he sound like a stereotypical italian that is cultural appropriation it's stereotyping how dare you how come there aren't any uh characters of color in it i see you know what i i i don't want to i don't want to go <laughs> too far down this particular pathway but as near as i can tell there's a pretty big segment of japanese pop culture that's just like we don't fucking care about this yeah we make japanese shit for japanese people and we don't care we don't we just don't care yeah um but i don't know anyway I, yeah, in super nintendo world did somebody go there toshi go there tell me what go. it's like enjoy it next Have fun. year or whatever it's open because they're only just starting on it right now uh, all right, let's jump into uh, some more video game stuff. So uh, Phil Spencer had a tweet today, um, or I don't know whenever tweets happened yesterday as, a, as or, well, I guess it was, to, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Says the Xbox briefing Sunday will, ru will likely run longer than our traditional 90 minutes for those recording, just a heads up. Um, so this is very little information. Yeah. But... It's led to it led me down one path and it led another journalist down another path. And I think that both of them are kind of interesting. So I've been saying for a long time now, and those people who listen to this podcast, I'm sorry you're listening to this again, but <laughs> I'm going to make it the short version, right? Uh -huh. The Xbox One needs games, needs Xbox yep. One exclusive titles, uh -huh. because right now the PlayStation is kind of kicking their ass in that way. Multi-platform titles, it's fine. You know, yeah. it's, you, it's fine. You buy Mass Effect, you buy it on the PlayStation, you buy it on the Xbox. Relatively similar, right? Mm -hmm. But right now, the PS4 is kind of whooping their ass in a lot of ways. First, the PS4 Pro is already out. Second, I mean, last week, I got a PSVR. Microsoft just hasn't even announced any kind of, like, VR solution, right? Yeah. So that, just those... The Scorpio is coming out, I think, in another eight months or something like that. But there's just tons of stuff on the on the PlayStation that I just can't get on the Xbox. Like, you get a PlayStation, you get a PC, and you got, like, 90% of your games covered. Just yeah. Nintendo and a few Microsoft exclusives. And with their Windows 10 thing, if you had Windows 10 on your PC, chances are you're going to be able to play a lot of the stuff that's on the Xbox One anyway. So I feel like the thing that they've been missing is a reason when you're at the store and you're looking at the two consoles to buy an Xbox One instead of a PS4 because they're relatively similar in hardware. Mm -hmm. They're pretty much the same in price. Mm -hmm. Connect isn't shit anymore. The TV thing is largely petered out. Yeah. What you basically have is do I want fewer games or do I want more games? I mean, outside of your social circle, right? If your friends all have Xbox Ones because everybody loves Halo, 
great, you know, buy an Xbox One. But they really need a reason to, they, they need a bunch of games. And they, they announced need, a bunch. They need like a selling point for Xbox and not right. just video games in general. So what I'm hoping is that being more than 90 minutes, that they're just going to come out and be like, game, coming out, game, coming out, game, so coming spend out. like 90 minutes on some kind of racing game that nobody gives a shit about and then another 30 minutes on like a football game. I uh, Were they the ones that did that last year or they just spent like a lot of time where we're like why are we why are we watching a thing about racing cars? Yeah, it's well that's Forza. I mean it's one of their big things. Yeah. Like they they got the I just want to prevent you from getting too hyped at the idea. Well, so here's the thing. As I've always said before, I want them to succeed. Yeah. Because the closer, the the more that they have to fucking knife fight Sony for every dollar means that that's the only way that we, the consumers, win. Because the only way that they do price drops and specials yeah. and try to entice you to buy their console over the other one is if they're neck and neck. If Sony is too far ahead... Which they're not entirely like the place. The Xbox still has good sales figures. It's just Sony got so far out ahead. It's hard to to make up the two of them. They just need games, and they need games now. They need them right now. They need them before the year is out. They need a reason this holiday season to buy an Xbox One instead of a PlayStation Four yeah. when Little Johnny wants one, right? Like so, that's what they need. And I'm hoping that this is what they're doing, and that. It's not some other bullshit. Now, there's an article that was written over on, um, what is this, Uh, The Verge, that basically speculates that the reason this might be longer is because Microsoft is going to try to do something really different and basically start marketing the Xbox as a computer as well as a console. And the idea here is that if Microsoft can sell you a Scorpio... Uh But you can also buy Microsoft Office for it, have an email client, do stuff, hook up like a peripheral that's maybe like one of those keyboard touchpad things. Yeah. That because the Windows 10 is the base architecture for the Xbox One, that you could be looking at a computer that, say, a college student could buy, but they could also have a video game console at the same time. Now, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, that's kind of intriguing. I just don't know if they should do that. But wow. you're the problem that I feel with that is that it's it's not going to do anything for the problem of the Xbox because let's be just real solid about this, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's already got a way to check their email. We've all got fucking smartphones yeah, and laptops phones. and yeah. iPads and everything. Just everything checks your email. Oh, look at Mr. Rockefeller over here. He's got iPads and cell phones and laptops. No, that's just like a regular people <laughs> thing. You probably have everybody probably has one of those things, right? At some point, yeah. some kind of computer, some kind of phone, right? Yeah. So the idea of like, oh, well, a college student, they're going to use their Xbox One as an app machine, or like you're going to use it as a set top box. I feel like the industry has been trying to push the idea of a set top box computer, a computer that hooks up to your TV that you can access from your couch mm-hmm. for. 20 years now without success but maybe this time jeff but maybe this time (laughs) well this is also something that i think kind of comes off like we didn't ask any college students what they wanted right and this is us pitching what we think they want it's just it's if that's what happens i feel like uh, this is just like like the xbox one stumbled and then it kind of fell down a little bit and then it like really face planted and now it just went running head first off the side of a cliff because <laughs> if that's what you're trying to market your console as guess what now you're competing with actual pcs laptops cell phones yeah tablets everything right and right now you're competing against the switch than the xbox and pc or in the ps4 and pc gaming but if you're trying to market it as both a computer and a gaming platform that already exists it's called a computer yeah. and it's more powerful than your thing like i just don't know yeah um, i mean but we i guess we won't know until sunday the, yeah the day that this podcast comes out so um while i'm ranting and raving <laughs> they're like jesus jeff they announced like 18 games right right and right. they dropped the price point sure and they made them in fancy new colors Great. I think they should You're do all those the things. The blue Xbox. I think that I think they should I call it the blue box. I think <laughs> I think they should do all of that stuff immediately because yeah. Sony has this one leg up that I feel like Microsoft just doesn't have and that is that Sony is a Japanese company. So all the dumb 
booby games like Gal Gun and Senran Kagura and all those bullshit games. How dare you, Jeff? What? I don't think dumb I, booby games. I don't think it's inaccurate to call those games dumb booby games. How dare you? They all come. You out don't understand the intricacies of these games. Thank you for being the <laughs> audience surrogate for me for a moment. Um, or or the craptastical um, uh, NIS RPGs, right? These yeah. little like thirty dollar RPGs or the weird ones that don't i mean they don't come out on the xbox one they come well, out when uh, americans make a bunch of rip off crappy games it's just a bunch of minecraft stuff well so yeah you can't even like what's the point well no but the, <laughs> what i'm saying yes exactly <laughs> but the thing is that those games exist on the ps4 mm-hmm. they don't exist on the xbox one so like the catalog of games that you can get access to on the ps4 is larger than the category of games you get access to on the xbox one so, and so what I if want they were like, change. we're making it a thing that all independent gaming people are, it's going to be Mondo super easy to release your game on the Xbox. They did that on the Xbox 360. It was called the Xbox Live Indie Channel, and it was a nightmare hellscape of Minecraft I did, ripoffs. I did actually buy a lot of games off of that, uh, by the way. What was their little <laughs> Xbox avatar, like uh, like a little shoot your avatar simulator there was a bunch of apps that were like it's a massager and it just turns on the rumble pack and then you could like put it on your whatever that sounds like it's made for masturbation yeah in fact uh let me tell you what happens when you open up those floodgates is you get steam green light oh yeah which is uh was i take back all the things i say yep abused not curated and it became a cesspool of garbage dick crap yeah balls 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 just balls everywhere. Uh, now, fortunately, Steam Green Light's going away. Yay! It's shut down. Well, they're trying a new system that's going to be a little bit better curated. And that's what- the big problem for me is that they didn't want to like get the it, pay people to go through and make sure it was just like at best an algorithm well no it was at a community. worst just, it was a voting community and, and you shouldn't trust the community well uh, they were the, well they they ended up running the people that were making crap ass asset flip games ended up running scams where they were like i'll give you a free copy of the game you upvote my game on green light we're going to push this thing out to the marketplace and then i'm going to actually make the money on the Steam card system when people buy a card mm-hmm. and I get a kickback from every card purchase because people just want to get a full set of cards. So weird and messed up. Anyway, that system is down and their new, what is it called? The system uh, is down. Uh, Steam Direct <laughs> is the new one. And one of the questions about Steam Direct that we've had is that Steam Direct is doing a thing where they want, they're going to, they're going to charge people money to submit a game for approval on steam so yeah. before it was even up there you had to give them like a registration fee this was mostly considered a way to keep people from just throwing games until yeah, they like, finally got one on there right yeah. um but the question had been what is the price point that is high enough to keep people from just spamming but low enough to actually keep small indie not rich developers to be able to actually get their game on the steam and today they forty seven dollars. Well, they announced it. It is one hundred dollars. Oh, I was. That's funny. I was thinking five hundred dollars, but one hundred yeah. is actually pretty low. I mean, I feel like if you're the the people who are big offenders on Steam, I feel like a lot of times would just be like they'd be just pushing games like tons of games out. Yeah. And I feel like this is high enough that even if you're a small developer, it's low enough that if you're a small developer, anybody should be able. If you're doing game development, you should be able to scrape a hundred dollars together. Yeah to go i mean i know that's not always the easiest thing but like there has to be some barrier to like factor in a hundred dollar fee to try to get on there than it is a thousand yeah exactly Um, on the other hand if you're some craptastical asset flipper and you're just pumping games out it's going to keep you from just it's going to slow every single game is going to be another hundred dollars to try to get it online so actually i think this is good yeah i'm hoping that it it cleans up steam a little bit and gives us a little bit better i wonder if those prices will change it's possible like I mean, if they're like no this didn't help we're gonna go up to 400 steam has been trying to quotey fingers fix this for a long time so it wouldn't surprise me if, yeah. if they get that um so yeah that's that's valve and that's um xbox so let's talk a little nintendo okay let's do on. it we already talked nintendo 
Well, let's talk some more Nintendo. Okay. <laughs> First off, um, there's a Pokemon Nintendo Direct that we can't talk about because it's happening like... Right now as we speak? Like five hours from when we're recording. So, um, you know, we'll talk about that next time yeah. or maybe not at all. Well, you're, or Pokemon. you and John will talk about it because you'll have them for all the E3 stuff. That's true. Uh, but Nintendo also released a little bit of information about their whole like online service. Mm -hmm. So, um, when the switch was announced, they announced they were going to do the same thing that everybody else does where in order to play games online at a certain point, you're going to have to give Nintendo money for, you know, the subscription fee essentially for an online service. Yeah. They announced though, that it's going to be cheaper than the ones from Sony and Microsoft. Uh, it's going to be, if you go month by month, it's $4 a month. If you do a three month membership, it's eight bucks. And if you do a year, it's $20. Oh, that's nothing. Yeah. The only thing that's Chump a little... change is what that is. The only thing that's a little weird is that they're going to be giving out like classic NES or classic Nintendo games every month, kind of like the PlayStation Plus and the Xbox games with gold yeah. do. Mm -hmm. um, except that it has been confirmed that at the end of the month when they delist those, it goes away and you get a new set. Yeah. Uh, I kind of I agree. Can't, I can't be mad at $20 though yeah, for a year. For a that, year. And be yeah. like, oh man, I am spending all month playing this game. And then once it goes away, you're like, <laughs> move on. Fucking ice climber or some bullshit anyway. Then, who, like, then what does who, it matter? Who cares? Yeah. Know, if it goes away. Yeah. But so, if it's like a really good game and you're like, no. Nah. Well, then you can go buy it. We yeah. probably go buy it off their store. No. So. Twenty dollars a year. Twenty dollars a <laughs> That's year. That's all they get from me. That is it. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. Uh, seems at least for the time being, it seems like a pretty decent deal to check it out. You know. Yeah. I don't do a lot of online um, multiplayer games anymore, but eh, they still do the like friend code thing, right? I think so. That's like fucking elaborate to add people. I mean, I just told you I don't do online. I mean, I thought you might know that. No, I, I actually don't. I think that <laughs> I think that there's still friend codes, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what's not so friendly. What? The internet hackers. Oh no, not again. Yep. Did you finally get hacked? No. Um, oh. but I'll tell you who did. That's CD Projekt Red, the makers of The Witcher Three. So, uh, last week, um, basically, somebody holding their game for ransom. Sort of. Really? Yeah. Oh man. So some. People got a hold of design documents and files and things for the game Cyberpunk 2077, which is their next game that they're making. Mm -hmm. And they basically said to CD Projekt Red, you need to give us money or else we're going to release this information to the public. And CD Projekt Red published an, a letter online today that basically was just like, those documents are old and also we don't give a fuck. Hey, everybody, be careful because there might be spoilers for the story. If you don't see the information come from us, please don't read it. But we're not going to be muscled around by a bunch we of We don't fucking... negotiate with terrorists. Yeah, exactly. Good. Uh, I'm glad. I just automatically more respect for them. Yeah, which uh, it just reminds me of one time somebody tried to extort me for bitcoins. And I was just like, <laughs> they were like, oh, we'll show people. I don't remember even what it was. They were just like, oh, we'll publish your real name or something. And I was like, everybody yeah. already knows my yeah. name. Like, Cool. I had, that's so funny. I was just thinking about this. I had a guy uh, say he was going to tell John something. Uh -huh. And like, <laughs> just the way it came out, it, it implied that like I was cheating. But I wasn't cheating. Yeah. And the best thing was John had already known about this. <laughs> so it became a thing where they were like, I could, you know, it'd be a real shame if John were to find out. And I was like, John! <laughs> hey, John! It's one of the nice things about being on the internet is that I'm kind of like, you know how many embarrassing stories, like, I don't have, yeah. you know. Gonna, I have no shame. Right. Guilt me. I'm Do like, what you will. <laughs> I wish, I wish I had an Ashley Madison account to get hacked to just be like, guys, I have to tell you. <laughs> Sorry, I've been bone and married women. Terrible this whole secret. Time. I've been a gigolo. <laughs> Jeff can't close was a smoke screen to keep all my it gigolo. Was, it was all a clever ruse. It was a clever ruse. <laughs> I've been closing constantly. <laughs> I just want to tell you before the hackers release my information. <laughs> no. <laughs> when I tell people. Uh, you better watch out. Somebody's going to find your dick pics, man. When uh, what, when somebody came to. I don't have. I've never <laughs> taken a picture of my dick. I wouldn't even want to. Like, what do you. Why, why would I need a picture of my dick? I can look down I, and see whatever I, 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 I want to. I assume you're sending it to other people, Jeff. Why would I what send you, a like, picture? Have a, who has, like, a 
back catalog of their own dick. Well, I don't know. I don't have any catalog of my own dick. It's right there. I just, if I want to look at it, I look at it. If I want to just show it to somebody else, zip. <laughs> I don't feel the need to put it into the digital ether. That's hilarious. I don't know why that's so funny to me. I, I feel like I've never been able to understand sending a dick pic. It, to me, it's like hooting out a car window or like a cheesy it's, pickup line. It's I, like a Hail Mary that has literally never worked. I love that people call it an unsolicited dick pic as if people are asking for dick pics. I've never in my life, and I've been sent quite a few dick pics. Sure. Have I've you, been sent <laughs> dick pics, Jason. Yeah, I was going to say, didn't Jason request it? There were mostly balls in them, but you know. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> do you have that back catalog? They're gonna be like, "Here's Jeff's weird ball collection." There were three, and I think it was like, "All right, time to post a video. Let's check my email." Oh God, Jason, <laughs> deleted, deleted. I hope um, people know that that's because Jason requested it from the audience, and not Jason sending you pictures of his own ball. Oh yes, it's not. <laughs> If it was Jason sent it to me, I would save them for if he ever tried to do like something important and be like, well, uh, that new movie's working out really well. It'd be a shame if people knew what your testicles look like. <laughs> looked like. Um, <laughs> Pretty sure they get taken down Instagram. So, I mean, is there like that's the problem is that I just don't know enough about online dating. But there's one that's like, yo, girl. And then like, boonk, And then they're like, and then the lady's like. Hmm, I don't know. That's a pretty nice looking wang you got there. I don't. Captain Stabbing 420. Like, <laughs> let's meet for coffee, I guess. Yeah, I don't I don't know who that works with. I mean, like, not if, ever, me. if I was a lady and people were sending me that shit on t- Tinder, I'd be like, you realize I'm putting this on Facebook. And if I can find your name, I'm tagging you in it, right? Like, you and your mom. <laughs> and your mom. <laughs> yep. Uh, all right, well, now that we've got all the dick talk out of the way, <laughs> let's uh, let's move on to the trailers. Um, so our first trailer this week is Middle Earth Shadow 4. This is the story trailer. This is a three-minute long trailer that, I mean, I'll be honest, is action-packed and, oh, yeah. like, story, and it looks real good and just, like, woo. I mean, this might come off as a dumb thing to say for a story trailer, but it definitely felt like a movie. Oh, yeah. Like, it felt very cinematic. And not just in the sense that it's, you know, the cinematic cuts, but just, like, it, I mean, it feels like it's, like, a fully developed story going on. Yeah, yeah. And not, like, a video game story. I don't know if any of that makes sense. Well, it also doesn't hurt that it's based in Lord of the Rings that we've seen yeah, all this so iconography Yeah, so there's an entire before. world already built around it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but this is, this looks like, if this was a movie, I couldn't wait to go see it, yeah. right? But... It's not. It's a video game, and I'm going to get to lead an army of orcs, and they're going to be my orc buddies. I'm going to be like, yeah, buds. Yep, brainwash your little Scientologist orcs or whatever. Damn right. The guy even looks like Tom Cruise. He does. <laughs> um, and he's running, so you know it's true. But he's not doing the Tom Cruise run. He's not. You know. He's looking at the blade running. Yeah. Like his hands are blades, so yeah. he can slice <laughs> through the air. <laughs> Aerodynamic. <laughs> um, but yeah, it looks real good. It yeah, it looks, looks great. really good. And like top-notch like faces and music and acting and just visual design. Like it looks good. It sounds good. It smells really nice. There's mm-hmm. just, it feels good to the touch. It's very soft. You like touch it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's got like that like good texture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I can't wait. I can't wait to play this. This looks really great. It looks yeah. like they took everything from the first one and then like upped it and they're making it better. And this is honestly what I want to see out of video game development, where this game came out and was like a big hit, and nobody saw it. Well, people saw it coming, but it, it, it was still was more than what was expected. There were a lot of bad Lord of the Rings games before Shadow of Mordor yeah. came out, and um, this looks like they got a lot of credit from me for Shadow of Mordor, and this looks fucking great. Um, Hashtag Lunchbox Twenty. <laughs> snack box <laughs> snack box that's what it was <laughs> snack box 20 um there's also a point in this trailer though at the beginning where sora is like bring me everyone and all i can think of is fucking gary oldman and everyone <laughs> just Sauron like chewing on pills <laughs> <and> like <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'd be great i'm gonna redub i'm just gonna put do that thing in premiere where you just motion track a really bad head over somebody nice. else's head that's a really good use of your time. Jim. Yeah, I know. I know. It's a it's it's truly awesome. <laughs> um let's see, next up on the trailer parade, we have 
uh, Strange Brigade. I'm kind of into this. Is a 1930s adventure game from Rebellion, the guys who made Sniper Elite. Um, and it's like a four player, like British Empire. I think it's just going to be a multiplayer shooter. That's yeah. the thing is that I, I don't think it's actually going to be. The problem that I have is that um, Sniper Elite has multiplayer modes. I'm just not interested in that. Like, I'm interested in the single player mode of Sniper Elite. I dig the style on this trailer. Yeah, I'm like, that's what I'm really into is just the way everyone looks. They're, the way the um, villains the narrator look. Sounds. Yeah, the narrator. Yeah, the <laughs> oh, evil. Yeah. Head to adventure. Raw oh, Dateline 1930. Mm-hmm. Uh, Love it. Yeah. I like the character design and all that stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll have to see how it goes. There's like a giant Anubis at some point that they're just like blasting on yeah. and undeads. I there's also, a- I do like the twist in it. Like just the, it just seems like an adventure. And then all of a sudden there's like zombies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah, I, I like the giant Anubis. I'll be, I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, but I just wonder, is it just going to be kind of like a wave based shooter? Because I feel like Sniper Elite already has that. And that Rebellion, I like what they do with games like Sniper Elite. Mm-hmm. But they're kind of a low rent studio. Like, if anybody from Rebellion is listening, I'm sorry. But it's just like they made three Nazi zombie army spinoffs for Sniper Elite. Yeah. Three. And it was like. One of those is fine. Yeah. Now, granted, I think we played all three of them, but, you know, that's just because Butt Sniper, and then we like it, and they put it out, but, <laughs> but like... Now I hope that somebody from Rebellion is uh, listening so that they can be like, what the fuck is Butt Sniper? Yeah. No, you got you to go watch it. Um, on the other hand, they did make the Kill Hitler DLC, and I can't really fault them for that. So. I, it looks to me like it's going to be a fun game and maybe not some like new innovative game. Just something. Just like a four player blast yeah. and stuff. And, and and for me, that's like, and it's appealing enough to gain my interest. Okay. Fair enough. Let us know what you think down in the comments, ladies and gentlemen. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> next one is. Keep a, it to yourself. <laughs> very short, short trailer for Hellblade set. set I keep wanting to say Setsuna, but it's not. It's Seuna's God, I forgot how sacrifice. ugly that girl's face is. How what? Ugly her face is. Oh, it's motion capture. It's a real person. Yep, <laughs> it sure is. They picked a doozy. Um, I actually... I think, think it's her eyes. This game looks really good. It just... It's been... It's one of those games where it's been in development. Senua's? Senua's Sacrifice? Mm-hmm. It's been in development for so long that I it needs to fucking come out already. Yeah. Like... Uh, at the end, it's weird because this trailer is like 45 seconds long. And then at the end, there's this whole thing with the developer going like, hey, everybody, we're a studio, 20 people. And we're trying to bring back the mid-tier video games. That's why this game is $30. That's a weird goal to have. It's download only. All the money will be heading back to them instead of getting put into a publisher company. Yeah. Um, so they're saying, so go pre-order it. We would like that. And it's like, okay, but... Uh, yeah, you're right. That's a little weird. Right. I like, it's kind of like, hey, everybody, we're B students. We don't no A's over here. <laughs> like, well, here's the thing is that actually I I miss mid tier games because right and and but you can try to make good mid tier games. I just don't know if calling your game a mid tier game is a smart thing to do. If like pointing at it, if pointing yeah. it out. Yeah, I agree. I mean, because they obviously like to be like, hey, this is a good game. I mean. It could do better. This yeah. is a weird thing to say. Yeah, especially when they when they're kind of like touting that it's thirty dollars. They're just like, yeah, we're not. This is a mid tier game. That's why we're only charging half of what those AAA games are. And it's like, we just charge everybody forty dollars, and like that's fine or yeah. whatever. Uh, but I guess they're maybe trying to change the definition of what a mid tier game is, or <sighs> at least the idea of what a mid tier game is. I also don't think that they're the company to do this because the last game was. DMC, which I personally liked. Me too. And, but and this game is so, like a Viking ass chick uh, kicking ass. I don't think she's a Viking. I think they, there's some well, they Viking stuff some in there. Viking lore, so I'm gonna say yeah. that it's at least in more. Do, do you actually know anything about this game? Fucking no. Oh, because like <laughs> a big part of it is apparently this idea that they have that the main character has mental illness, and it's like she's Ooh. a warrior, but she's actually fighting her own like kind of internal battle with just like straight up 
psychosis at the same time as like this weird shit's happening and so there's kind of a is it reality or is it her own in her head or yeah. what's going on so it actually seems like a really interesting concept it's just for me this is another concept this is another case of you announced this shit like three or four years ago just fucking put it out already if like, it's a mid-tier game shouldn't it have been easier to uh release uh i think that they announced it too early uh, oh. and they still had too much work left they to got do too it. hyped yeah yeah um Speaking of people being too hyped, hey, everybody, there's a new Bubsy game. The game company Accolade is back, and they're making a new Bubsy game called Bubsy, the Woolies Strike Back. I missed 1993. Did it's you? a side-scroller with Bubsy, one of the worst <laughs> video game <laughs> characters. He's a bobcat who looks like Garfield, and he's wearing a shirt with an exclamation point on it. He's very excited about that shirt. He collects balls of yarn. And He's a fucking cat. Of course he collects a balls of yarn. What else would he collect, Jeff? He floats through the air for whatever reason. Because he's a cat and he's graceful. Jesus, Jeff. Yeah. Were there um sharks running through the dirt? Yep. Dirt okay. sharks. Dirt shark. yep. Land there's some, sharks. There's some land sharks going on there. All right. Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, this game looks like garbage to me. It looks like <laughs> total and complete garbage. The graphics look like... They came from three years ago. Yeah, which it just looks old. The gameplay that they're showing looks like terrible. I don't even think there's a single part of this trailer where Bubsy's doing anything outside of just jumping. Like, there's no, like, attacking an enemy or doing anything. And it's, it's got this whole, like, Bubsy is back. But the trailer itself is even, like, kind of, like, under, it's muted. Like, it yeah. doesn't, it needs to be, like, a much more of a blah, wow, blah, blah. A Bobcat Goldthwait trailer. <laughs> so, uh, I th actually, it turns out that Xbox One's 90 minutes is going to be... Mostly Bubsy. Oh, well, yeah. It's all Bubsy. Maybe they'll squeeze in some time to talk about other things. I'm going to tell you, you can keep your Bubsy. You can keep your Rocket Knight. You can keep your James <laughs> Pond. You can keep... Uh, well, James Pond, sorry. You can keep your Gex the Gecko. Gex the Gecko can not only be kept, but you can also take all of his other games and throw them into a fire and burn them and never talk about it ever again. He always makes me think about Geico. Yeah. That's why you could throw them into a fire. <laughs> um, I don't know. This is just the sort of game that I'm like, Rayman does it better. You know, actually, I should have I should have kept this on the list. The guy that made Super Meat Boy announced a new game called mm -hmm. The End Is Nigh this week that looks like a side-scrolling platformer, but it's in that kind of, like, hard-ass um, yeah. yeah, Super Meat Boy. You play it a little bit, and then you get real pissed off, and then you have to stop playing for a while. Right, which is more appealing to me than some milk toast yeah just side scroll and bs i'd rather play rayman any day of the week dude like, i love rayman it's so fast and it's fluid and it's got all kinds of stuff like the music's great yeah there's great humor to it yeah it's fucking fantastic and it, the joke at the beginning of this trailer sucks there was a joke at the beginning of the trailer he's like war and like famine and it's like blah 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 and yeah you schmack but i'll tell you what really sucks is being deprived of yarn or something like that uh, it's just like Oh, fuck off, Bubsy. <laughs> like, also, I just can't tell you how ugly I think this game looks. Uh -huh. Like, it just looks like, like a shitty Unity game. <laughs> Actually, that's not true because I played Unity games that look better than this. Ooh, fighting words. Bubsy's going to come kick your ass. Good. I hope he tries. That way I can strangle him and pull his fucking bobcat <laughs> head off. So when I said you, you shot a dog... Really, what I should have said is, like, you shot Bubsy. Oh, I would have been like, hell yeah, I wish I yeah, shot Bubsy. Two bullets. I don't know. You tell me why there's any reason. This is nostalgia. Pure nostalgia bait is all yeah. that it is. It's like you remember playing Bubsy when you were a kid, right? And I do, but it was crap then and it's garbage now. I so. didn't when I was a kid because the cover of it looked um, cheap. stupid. It looked real cheap and I wasn't into it. Anyway, um, and I'm going to skip this one anyway because we're running along. So I'll tell you what else is a real nostalgia wank, and that is. The Agents of Mayhem Johnny Gat trailer, yeah. um, which is really irritating to me because all of the I don't know if you Get you, you've been <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've been watching, but like all of the trailers have had some other song. It was like A Team yeah. and Night Rider, and the next one is Oh, I Magna I know PI. John is super hyped for this. Yeah, so I know everything about it. Okay, I don't know why. <laughs> John is super high because he'll literally be like, have you seen the new trailer? And I'm like, nah, you're going to buy it. I'll just watch you play it. And he'll be like, no, 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 hang on. And then he'll play it. And I'm like, I didn't want to. I just 
You I know? mean, did you play Saints Row? Yeah, all the okay, time. Yeah. Okay. Um, this, I mean, I don't know. Johnny Gat, like, okay, so let me let me say the things that I like about this. One, Johnny Gat is a character that I like when they're not abusing him like they did in Gat out of Hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, two. Bad news. Uh, <laughs> um, the the use of the Flash Gordon theme song is fantastic and brilliant. I love it. Yeah. And it's been stuck in my head all day. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a pre-order exclusive. A specifically GameStop pre-order yeah. exclusive. And Therefore, at fuck it. <laughs> that point, it all falls down. Because while I will sometimes pre-order a game, like I pre-ordered Sniper Elite so I could have that Hitler thing mm-hmm. so that Grant and I could shoot Hitler. And it was fun as hell and everybody loved it. Just playing as Johnny Gat is not enough of a draw for me to do this. It is enough for me. Yeah? Well, it's enough for John. Yeah. I'm not buying it. I don't have to. John's hyped. This goes back in. I mean, unless you give me a really good reason, and then and then never, never the retailer exclusive one, never the retailer exclusive one, because that means that GameStop like bought this shit and like I don't know, it just doesn't. Yeah, it's gross to me, and I don't like it. Yeah, which sucks because I like the concept. Fine, I think the trailer's amazing, yeah. but but they always come out with really good trailers. Yeah, that's it's true. Hard because they're so fucking. I don't know, right up. Our alley. Just cheesy. The kind of people we are. 80s, 70s, and 80s nostalgia. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I'd be more than happy to get this. I'd actually probably pre-order the game maybe to get this if it was, if I could do it. If it was just wherever. Not GameStop. If I could pre-order it on my PlayStation 4, which is where I do most of my pre-ordering. What if, like, other uh, retailer, like, Amazon has a different character that's an exclusive character? I wonder if they would all be like Saints Row. If it's like Shandy, it's and like then all like, the other. Uh, if Pierce is in the game, so I don't think he'd be a, de- a DLC. Is Pierce in the game? Yeah, he's referenced. That. He's referenced in the first trailer. Hmm. I know because John fucking told me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, that stuff is still just scumbaggy because eventually, in eight months to a year, they're gonna they'll release it. Yeah. Like it'll be a thing that you can get on sale for twenty dollars. Like here's all the DLC. Yeah. But, Anywho, um, it's not exactly DLC, but there is a giant patch that came out for um, Mass Effect this week, which yeah. we're not playing, but they changed. So apparently they added some new character creation options. They made it so that you can put any hair on any character, regardless of man or woman. They added Ooh. some different skin tones and one new face option that you can change from the beginning. They changed that thing with the dialogue for um, uh, what's her face, the transgender character, so that she doesn't just like say, hi, I'm transgender. Like you have to get to know her a little bit yeah. so that it's not just like, this is the thing about me. Like immediately. I, as a transgender. Right. Yeah. Um which is fine. I think that Bioware, they had a whole thing where they put this character in and people didn't feel that they were handling it very well. And so they said, oh, we'll make some changes. Yeah. Um, for Amanda, they added a, an option where dude characters can romance the new alien guy companion or whatever. Okay, nice. Um, so they added in. I mean, I play as a female character. So. Okay, well. I mean, I know that one of your problems in Mass Effect 3 was that, like, you played as a dude character and oh, there yeah. weren't enough dude-on-dude dude romance it options. It was very difficult, and it would be like, you had a pre-established relationship from the second Mass Effect right. on, and it's just like, fuck, man. A Jal. Uh, yeah. Jal, yeah. He was, he's a good character. So, um, that's great, but it brings up, again, a point that I keep trying to make, which is, I don't know how I'm supposed to judge a game... When, that is able to do this yeah. because a lot of this stuff should have been in the game when it launched. And if they keep making updates that are this dramatic, like we're well past the launch window of Mass Effect Andromeda. So it's like they, cause they're doing a similar thing with Final Fantasy 15 where they're adding in all this stuff and they're like changing certain things in the game. They're making like structural changes to the game yeah. with updates as time goes on. You go, well, so do you expect me to like buy a new game? But wait to play it until you fix all the bullshit that should have been done before you put the game in? Well, as far as reviewing, like as somebody that's on the internet that has their own video game website, not that you're doing like standard or formal reviews, but I feel like once you're past that hype window or that like the just the open, like the release window, I guess. um, it's too little too late. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you already, like, the money that you were going to get from it, you already got that money. The only people you're getting, 
now are like stragglers and they're not you're not going to be like a whole new surge of people that are like oh good they fixed the game now we all have to go out and get it so really this is just to fix it for the people that already purchased it and then the question is is it worth it as somebody who already purchased it to have these things fixed i I guess so here's the thing is i'm not even talking about it from a reviewer standpoint i'm Uh just thinking about it from a play in the game standpoint where like if a game is if if we get into a cycle okay so in my opinion we've we're this is a needle that is moving between releasing a game because mass effect is not like in an mmo Mm -hmm. you're gonna need to fix stuff right players are gonna find ways to break the game this quest is gonna fuck up if you do this you're gonna drag a plague into a city whatever right yeah that's an online game. It, you expect constant updates. But Mass Effect, I feel like it used to be that we could just put in the disc, put in the cartridge, right, in the mm-hmm. beginning. And yeah. That was the game. There was no thing you could do to change it. As time went on, we started getting, like, a lot more day one patches where, like, the first day the game comes out, there's a bunch of fixes that go in because they're trying to hit those deadlines so hard that they can literally cert a game and then have a flash patch that comes in on the first day. Yeah. But now we're talking about going past the launch window to literally fix the game based on player feedback significantly after its release. And to me, that's incredibly problematic because it's like, well, let's just say I'm a regular ass gamer and I'm excited for Mass Effect Andromeda. There's now a case to be made that says that, well, if Mass Effect Andromeda comes out, that you should not play it when it comes out and wait for like a year and a half before you play it because they're not going to have everything ironed out because they literally put out a game that wasn't finished or they didn't take enough play testing into account to realize standard things that people would have take issue with or they didn't fix them before they came out. I mean, hell, the facial animations, day one, the facial yeah. animations were like, and everybody on the internet knew it, and Bioware knew it because they were on top of it working on it right away. Yeah. So, you really don't want your game to be like something that the internet laughs at. Right. Um, this is why everyone should have the Blizzard motto of it. It comes done. out when it's done. It's yeah. done when it's done. Yeah. It's done when it's done. Um, but I do like games having the option of. You know, like, they have a transgender character and people didn't think it was done properly and they have the option to go in and fix that. Mm -hmm. Um, Which might not be something somebody who's, like, playtesting it would give them feedback on. Or at least enough people would be playtesting it that they'd get that feedback. Do you know what I mean? I, I kind of feel like you, if you're going to be making that a part of your game, that it behooves you to have... Not if not a an employee at least to give it to a yeah group like of people, a consultant or a somebody of that transgender you, yeah, people yeah. and say hey tell me if this is coming off as like if I was to make a game that had like um uh homosexual gay quests and stuff in it mm-hmm. right like I feel like I would want to call up some of my gay friends and be like would you come look at what I've done here and make sure that this isn't like ridiculously offensive yeah. you know um I don't know it's just see I argue it from both sides because. The one side says that, well, what, are they just supposed to, like, have a broken, fucked up game and they got one chance at it and never make good? Yeah. Because, like, No Man's Sky was adding stuff in and I really appreciate that they were doing that. On the other hand, I don't like the idea of entering into a new phase of video gaming where the game isn't fucking done until a year after it's out. Yeah, I, I definitely don't like that where there it's kind of comes off like they, well, we said we were going to release it on Friday, so fucking send it out, yeah, whatever. It's, it's more important to get it out we'll than it is. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely not a good way to go about it. So, I don't know. Um, I'll tell you what doesn't need to be fixed in post, and that is Overwatch. Overwatch. So, what hey, the fuck are those? Uh, Overwatch is basically they're having this contest in Europe where a bunch of graffiti street team artists are making a bunch of custom controllers. Are they all diva controllers? Nope. They're all for different people in the game. So if we go up here to the top, this is Anna, Bastion, Diva, Genji, Hanzo, Junkrat, Lucio, that was just brown. I don't know. Is that Zenyatta or something? Is that Soldier 76 maybe with a little red at the top? I don't know. Um, anyway, these are... are <laughs> you were like, I can't name the rest. <laughs> oh, well, I can. I mean, that's Farah and that's... Uh, who is that? Is that Bastion? I'm going to say Bastion already. That's um, Reinhardt, Mercy. 
Ugh, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not going to do this because people can't see the screen that I'm naming stuff on. So yeah. anyway, but these are getting handed out um, by Blizzard uh, in a bunch of contests in Europe. These are handmade by street team artists who are making one PS4 and one Xbox One controller, huh. and then they're getting handed out. And it sucks because I would buy the fuck out of some of these. Yeah. I dude, want this I mean, Soldier some really 76 nice. one. <laughs> and some are uh, kind of boring. Some are kind of boring. Yeah. Like, like how the, dare you? Sombra one's pretty cool. I don't know what this one is. That's Farah. Oh, I just, I can't see the designs. I can only see the colors. So. Yeah. That's Widowmaker. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. I don't know. Some of them are really cool, but like, yeah, this Winston one was just a big Winston face on top of yeah. it. Yeah. Kind of oh, sucks. What up, skis? Yeah. Like the, yeah, the Diva one is real nice. It's just got the tags like from her mech and it's got the coloring and stuff. Some of them are cool. Some of them are not, but. I think it'd be cool if Blizzard gave us the opportunity to buy them if we wanted to. Yeah. Um, as opposed to letting people. Whoa, you need to calm down. I do. Need to These calm are down. actually uh, GameStop exclusives. So. You know what's going to help me calm down? <laughs> what? Uh, listen to a little Motorhead. Fuck yeah. So, last but certainly not least, this week, uh, Victor Vran Overkill Edition uh, launched, and with it was the Motorhead DLC where you can play as a tiny little you can Lemmy. Play as motherfucking Lemmy. Yep. Uh, acing all the spades through the <laughs> history of Motorhead. There's demons and guitars and fucking blah, 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 blah. demon faces. And, yep. Just yeah. All kinds of stuff. This actually looks really cool. Yeah, um, hell yeah. But not something that I would pay really very much money for. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's I do like the part with all the skeletons headbanging. Head yeah. <laughs> metal as yep. fuck. Yep. And that is our news. Uh, so stick around. We'll be right back. We have a ton of questions. We got a Oops. ton of questions last week. That means more than three? More than three. Yay! Some that don't even start with, hey, Jeff, this question only applies to yeah. you. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, stick around. We'll be right back uh, for more Rachel Podcast. And we're back. Yay! It's time for questions. Uh, MailRachelPodcast.com is the email address. Our first question this week comes in from Paul from London, who says, Hi, Jeff and Amanda. Uh, Watching the reveal of the new Far Cry, whilst not ever having an interest in the series, I must admit that the details of this latest one do have me intrigued. With its settings and themes, this feels like it has a lot of potential. But with the recent releases of Horizon and Zelda, it's also got me thinking about the state of open world gaming and whether people just look for a fresh coat of paint, plot and location, or existing mechanics of fetch quests and leveling up. Or if people are keen to see the genre evolve, are you happy to keep open world gaming uh, as it is, as long as the overall experience is compelling, or would you like to see things changed up in any way? If so, what would you change? Finally, if you were to come up with your own open world game, what would it be about, and how predominantly would Loco Steve feature? Your loyal listener, Paul from London. Paul also sent me a code for the new Wipeout game. Thank you, Paul. I already bought it. Uh, you can... <laughs> Give that too to your, little, too late, give Paul. Give that to, to your, your friend, even though I don't know that game's ever going to be on a single Tojo episode. <laughs> but um, I feel like my the thoughts on this have been pretty um, pretty well stated. Do you, so before I go into reiterating the things that I've already uh-huh. said, uh, what do you think? Have you played any of those games? I have. Um, can I say both? Like, I, I, I as long as it's, dynamic and interesting i don't mind if it's the same kind of general idea of what an open world game is okay. but i'm also not against them changing up and doing something new mm-hmm. i just don't know personally what that would mean i have an idea what would you do um uh contract uh is uh, instead of um a large gross area mm-hmm. i wish that they would use that it would be density, uh, like yeah. like a, a smaller area 
that like I like the idea of instead of using your enhanced power of the PlayStation, the Xbox One, and you know PCs have always been whatever. Instead of using them to create like this is you know this world is like Grand Theft Auto, but it's five times bigger than GTA. You 5. can travel the entirety of the United States of America. Exa- well, they did that in the crew, yeah. <laughs> sort of. Um, it was less like that, and it was more like okay, I'm going to give you a city the size of like a quarter of Grand Theft Auto Three. But every building is going to have an inside. You're yeah. going to be able to go in and you're going to be able to go into any room in that building. And they're going to be different. They're not just going to be like cookie cutter. So they're- not like what L.A. Noir was, where L.A. Noir implied that it was an open world game, but it was like a 100% linear game that yep. had the option to not go straight into the storyline. Yes, exactly that. Um, I mean, I, I I'm also know. real bitter about L.A. Noir. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, I we were just actually having this conversation. I felt like on last week's podcast with John, or maybe the one before, that was very similar. And L.A. Noir got brought up. Where I'm like, that is a game where the open world actually detracted uh, instead of enhancing. Yeah, it would have been better off just not. Having as, it that. would have been better as levels. Yeah. It would have been better if you started the level. There was a cutscene yeah, of like driving chapter one or whatever. Like mm-hmm. I would be so happy. You just like why format it like a fucking noir movie? Why? Yep. Why does it have to be a thing? Or make it smaller, but make things actually happen in it. Like spend more time. The problem I feel like there is that Team Bondi had this idea of the whole investigation mechanic, but they didn't ever have anything else yeah like and that rockstar i don't know if this is the case but like i feel like the the shooting and driving may have come from when rockstar bought team bondi to make la noir yeah. because it, but it was always just real substandard like it wasn't the shooting wasn't really super fun the driving was just monotonous as yeah, fuck God, it was awful um so the game was frustrating as fuck to play i just i i just started making my making my teammates drive there yeah um but, like, uh, you know, Shadow Mordor is actually a pretty good example of a game world that is small, mm-hmm. but that there's different things happening. The different fortresses feel a little bit different. There's They're using that power for, like, the nemesis system. It's not big I, enough. The nemesis system in and of itself is a great addition to an open world game. To mm-hmm. have something where something can come back at you anywhere at any time kind of thing is great. That That is way more fun than just a standard open world thing i probably like i would have when he talks about loco steve i would like a batman game where you had a smaller chunk of the city to work with but it was more detailed so you had more like crime and radiant stuff that happened like really i i I almost feel like okay so if you take like if you think of game development like a three-year game development cycle in terms of like what you can do in that time period i'd rather modern games be like a quarter of the amount of time, like a quarter as large as what they do, Mm -hmm. but have that, I mean, not even using it for density of detail, but if they were just making side quests that weren't go here, kill guy, come back, turn in, get your reward, get some experience points. If Mm -hmm. they were making quests that were more crafted, more nuanced and interesting and stuff like that, because that to me is, has a, a, a larger appeal that, will keep me playing longer. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I like Dark Souls so much, right? Is because the individual areas in Dark Souls are so crafted specifically to tell certain types of stories and certain types of enemies and places like that. I'd rather that attention to detail be paid to the stuff instead of just like, look how big it is. A a glut of land that has nothing in it. Yeah. Right. Like even in Grand Theft Auto, I feel like, you know, you spend a lot of time in Franklin's neighborhood before you get out into the world. When you get into Trevor, you're out in the sticks and you're doing different things. There's a whole thing where they have to leave LA because the heat's too high and they have to go run. They basically pull a job in the other smaller town that's like in the north side of the map. And that stuff was all really great. I just wish that more developers would do that because I feel like, I personally feel like there's a problem right now, and somebody just got done on Elder Scrolls uh, kind of taking me to task, so to speak, for it. But, Mm -hmm. like, I think the quality of game experience is more important than quantity. So if your Assassin's Creed game is roughly 60% the same type of mission, just repeated over and over and over again, I'd rather the game be smaller and have a better mission selection than just repeating the same thing over and over again um yeah that I makes sense i feel like that's what a lot of i mean like a uh, near automata i i was playing and it's this open world but it's largely just empty like there's some mooses and there's some robots and there's some quests that you can do but mm-hmm. like it's largely just 
the buildings are just scenery. There's nothing in them. They don't really do anything. When you go into one of them, they're just these big, flat, open areas. Yeah. And that's not the focus of the game, but I'd rather that game... There's a lot of, like, running back and forth in that game that I honestly don't feel um, enhances the storyline in any way. It makes the game world feel slightly bigger, but... Yeah. Do you think people do that to um, pad out their game time? Yes, absolutely. So they're like, oh, it would probably be maybe a 15 to 20 hour game, but now we add all this other stuff and it's going to be a 25 to 30 hour game. Absolutely. Uh, you know what? You know what is a you know is a 100% perfect example of what I'm talking about right now? Hmm. Doom. Uh, the way that the Doom levels have a density that you can engage with or not engage with. Yeah. Um, that there's all these secrets and there's stuff for you to do. There's And that the the different secrets are like a sets of platforming challenges or finding a door, or finding a, lev- a lever to open a door. Yeah. Or like a key card over here that gives you access to this secret or whatever. Yeah. But that you can engage with it or you can just fucking Blue gore passion, face your way yeah. through demons and get to the next thing. But then the game has tangible benefits. Like if you spend that time doing that stuff, your character becomes dramatically more powerful than if you just breeze through... But the game is still doable even if you do it. That's one of the reasons why a game like Doom, why I gave Doom such high marks last year is because it's so smart in the uh, the curve of its difficulty, mm-hmm. the way that it doles out weapons to you one at a time, and the way that it doles out the upgrades, and the way that all that meshes together into this wonderful experience curve where it never feels too easy, but it still feels like you're making progress and you're becoming more and more powerful. Whereas Far Cry, like I felt like in Far Cry four and far cry primal i always reach a place where i'm just so powerful that i just drive a dune buggy and pull out a heavy machine gun and just shoot everybody i because... mean it is weird that all those were available in primal and you just like <laughs> drove a dune buggy and start shooting the fuck out of people and they're like what the hell <laughs> um yeah how do you feel about saints rose uh open world especially like the last two games not get out of hell but uh three and four three and four well so four what I felt four was I four Saints Row four to me mm-hmm. is fascinating and it's a thing that I feel like um a lot of game developers could learn from. Saints Row four within the first hour has already made you too powerful to play Saints Row four. Yeah. The rank and file challenge of playing Saints Row Four is nothing. Mm-hmm. That Saints Row Four's focus is on we want you to have fun. Mm-hmm. We want you to feel powerful, and we want to make you laugh. Yeah. And so, like, as soon as you start to get bored, you just go do a mission. Like, the only th- – the things I would say in Saints Row 4 that I feel like were downsides were there were too many of those dumb orbs to collect. Yeah. And the towers got to be – they were too tall. They were very frustrating. Like, if you fell down one, you'd be like, fucking whatever. I'm done playing today. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, you know, when you get, like, the speed upgrade and you're, like, running down the street and all the cars are behind you I mean, and what stuff, about when like you fall it, from a high enough place and then you do your, like, power punch oh, to the yeah. ground and it'd be an atomic bomb? Well, and then the way that they iterated on Saints Row 3 things were, like, you know, in Saints Row 3 they had the uh, um, insurance scam, right, where mm-hmm. you would get hit and then you would hit the other cars. But in Saints Row 4, it was just broken. Like, you could just fly to yeah. the other side of the map <laughs> and then have another car hit you and use that to just go on top of the world and yep. then come back down again. And then they gave you all the crazy, like, just from the from the go, do you want to be a dominatrix superhero with a lightsaber katana? Go for yeah. it. Because it's not our job to tell you how to play this game. It's almost like a parody of um, open world games. Yeah. And, again, it's a game where um, it could have easily gone the other way if they had tried too hard to make it challenging mm-hmm. because you just want your player to feel real powerful. Like that's not a game where there's, there's nobody in saints row. Well, I'm sure that somebody in saints row is like, Oh, we beat the game just in level one, never collected a single superpower the entire time. Like, All right, fine, whatever. But like, yeah, that's weird. The game never, the game wanted you to punch a car at somebody or yeah. like fly through the air. I mean, it's a game where you can jack any car in the game and by the hour two, you, you don't need, need to. Cars, yeah. You never you need a car ever again <laughs> because you can fucking run at super speed and fly through the air with the greatest of ease. Yeah. Um, so I felt that that was great. Saints Row 3 kind of had a similar thing where as you – Saints Row 3 had that empire building thing where like as you collected – things you would get start getting more and more money and then yeah. that money could get you more and more crazy upgrades for cars and stuff but saints row 4 knew exactly what it was 
and didn't bother to just jerk you around being like, oh, you've got to be a really good gamer. Get What, you can't play Saints Row 4? Get good, noob. Yeah, there is no getting good. You start off all powerful. On the other hand, There's I know something that... something kind of fun about starting a game and feeling like a badass. Instead yeah. of starting a game and feeling kind of square one yep. and then working your way up, which is, you know, obviously most video games want you to do that. They want you to feel the journey. But Saints Row wanted you to feel like a badass the second you started. See, what I never understand is that, like, it's not like... Uh, game development like i have a real hard time with game development where they don't where that power curve doesn't happen fast enough mm-hmm. um because there's no reason why you can't give me the ability to fly and then the next chapter introduce like specifically enemies that are t- to get me out of the air like yeah. to knock me down like give me the power and then create a challenge for me to overcome yeah and then once i've overcome that like you can keep raising the stakes and if you start at like Superman, and then yeah. you just keep raising the stakes, then by the end of the game, you're like, "I'm riding a raptor through time." <laughs> <laughs> well, or the stakes of Saints Row Four, where they blow up the Earth in the first like what twenty minutes, yeah. or, like forty minutes or Something so. Like yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's like first. <laughs> it might even be first fifteen minutes. No, no, the, because they, you do the mission on the. They abduct you, and oh, then you get out right. of the simulation. Oh, you're right. You're right. And you go back know. in, and then eventually. In my head, it, he it was definitely exploded during that time but yeah. you're right yeah i mean the the <laughs> saints Row four the romance options are available as soon as the people are there you yeah. can just like fuck them as soon as and you the, want yeah, to you, you, don't, you don't have to work for it you just fuck them and then you move on and fuck somebody else yeah i did every time i went back on the ship somebody else had to get fucked yep um yeah it's great like that game is a a, a super great it's one of the reasons i keep coming back to it is because i feel like it's just like yeah this is a great game for just like i want to have some fun yeah like i don't care about you know, doing PvP in Dark Souls or getting good at Dota or like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um the opposite of that I feel is um and I, I every time this comes up it, it kind of pains me to say this, but like The Witcher three gives you a lot of power, but it just takes a long time. There's a lot of dead space. Yeah. There's a lot of like talking to somebody where I feel like they have four extra lines of dialogue that I don't want. And I'll be real honest, like, again, every time this comes up, I have, to, I have to say that you, the listener, who are furiously typing a comment right now, and me, mm-hmm. we're coming from two different perspectives, because I don't have an unlimited amount of time. Like, when Persona 5 came out, I still haven't played more than about 15 hours of that, because I just don't have time yeah. to sit down and sync the 80 hours that Persona 5 is into Persona 5. I'm sure that's a great game, yeah, but I just don't have time to do that, so I need one of two things i either need a game that is short to the point and fun or i want a game that could be long but is so compelling that i can't put it down because those are the games that i will play all the way to completion persona 5 is like a is a jrpg it's a it's a it's a sitting back i'm gonna waste a sunday just doing nothing but playing this the problem is that with an 80 hour jrpg i need to waste like every sunday for 12 sundays playing it right so that is a problem for me, and I really only have time for the tippy top of the tippy top when I could be playing plenty of other things. I mean, like, I've just got a PlayStation VR, right? And yeah. I want to be playing a bunch of stuff there. So, in back to Paul's question, I just feel like I want games to use that power and use the development time to give me a real, just a real good experience in a in a very compressed fashion. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know if I'm ever going to beat near automata because one of the things about near automata is that you have to beat the game three times to see all the good stuff and people are like it's amazing and that's a really interesting concept but the game took me like 15 hours to beat the first time and while it may only take me eight hours to beat the second time Mm -hmm. a lot of that is a repeat yeah why would you want to repeat eight hours of 15 hours you sunk in already which Whenever you're doing a thing, like, because the game, it's like these two robots, and the, the second time you play through the game is from the other robot's perspective, things are different. Mm-hmm. They may have a different game mode where you're doing hacking mini games instead of combat mini games, and that's cool. But there's still mission number two requires me to go from this area to the desert over here, which requires me to run across the map. Yeah. And that's just dead time for me where I've already done that. I wish that it would just kind of hurry up and get to the point. So, yeah. I don't know. Uh, this next one comes in from Ricky J. Ricky J. Who says, good day to you, distributors of the finest vintage anger on the interwebs. This is Ricky J on the site. Uh, this is a good vintage. Mm. Mm. 
Just mm. some vintage mm. anger. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> uh, loyal patron since the age of bar. Uh, my friends and I have played through Injustice 2 a few times. And while I'm borderline uh, retarded fighting games, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> the R word. I feel weird saying that. I feel weird saying all of it now. Yeah. While I'm borderline not good at fighting games, <laughs> and I know very little about DC, the Injustice games have always been something that I can pick up and enjoy. Mm-hmm. Uh, while we all agreed it's a fantastic game, we felt that the elements of the story seem to be channeling the current DC films, i.e. Superman is a cock and Batman is the best. Uh, my friend is a big comic book fan, and he really hates how DC is, quote, making Superman do something that he isn't by going dark, gritty, and sullen with him. While playing through Injustice 2 a second time, I made an observation which my friend agreed with that Supergirl, who is my favorite character in the game behaves more like classic superman so here's my question how did you feel about superman and supergirl in injustice 2 did you think supergirl was a good character do you like what dc is doing with superman in their movies come on ricky J. that's just a yeah it's just bait and finally are you tired of the bat worship that seems to have taken over all of media in the last few years i am uh thanks for all the great work you do keep posting and i'll keep watching insert kaveve reference here ricky J. okay let me get started on this one (laughs) um i haven't played through injustice all the way on my own i've been like around i've played against you i think a few times Mm -hmm. maybe probably uh and then i've played at home um, did John, we play versus each other? Didn't we? No, I know we'd played Tekken, so don't. Uh, this, maybe but, Injustice One on a Sunday stream. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Um, yeah, because like Lobo was available character then. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I personally don't like that lazy writers seem to think that the only way you can write an interesting Superman is by changing who Superman is as a character and basically making him a villain. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's lazy and it proves that they're not good writers because even when there's good uh, stories with it, uh, it it really proves something about them that they can't come up with a good story for somebody that's maybe has good morals. So they go, well, I can't write a character that like is good so i'm just gonna turn him into a bad guy so i can make him an interesting character like i honestly think it it, it's bad i I think that's lazy writing okay um having said that i didn't hate him in injustice injustice is actually well written like the comic book is so good yeah um i've only been through the first volume but it's well fucking written yeah so it's fine i mean it 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 can be used as an escape for writers who are like i don't know how to write superman so i'm just gonna change who he is uh, I don't feel like that was done in Injustice. I think it was just all the characters have to be OP and there has to be a reason for all those or, or like super powered because like Batman's not super powered. It doesn't make sense. Yep. Um, so they needed a reason. And I think making Batman the villain mm-hmm. kind or Superman the villain mm-hmm. uh, makes sense to then everyone needs to have superpowers and stuff like that. Um, I like Supergirl in it. I don't know what the question was about Supergirl. Did you feel like she's more of like what the classic Superman yeah, I think archetype they, is? I think they felt like they lost that character in the first game. Mm-hmm. So they needed it in the second game. And the obvious choice is Supergirl because, mm-hmm. you know, she's just another Kryptonian. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I just think it works. I think so. I don't know if I've actually talked about this yet. I know that I've thought about it a lot on my own. Mm-hmm. And um, as much as I get all bent out of shape about the movies, mm-hmm. um, I actually like evil superman and injustice the game uh first off so let me just say first off in injustice the game if you're making a mortal Kombat fighting game you need a reason for the heroes to fight each other because if it was just heroes versus villains then your story options are just so limited you really want to break people up into various factions so that you can basically write this story and then this story and then this story and while it was a little bit weirdly ham-fisted the whole kind of like joker murders lois has a bomb that'll detonate if he's killed and then like sprays superman with fear toxin and then like tells him that and then superman breaks his neck and then the 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 thing about it is that while the that's really convoluted yeah the idea of evil superman taking over is not convoluted Mm -hmm. and it is actually a pretty decent like i honestly feel okay so when a lot of times when people are writing superman i feel like one of the things they get hung up on is that like oh well there's nobody well, you know, superman what's gonna happen is he get shot by a mugger like there's no there's no physical threat to superman because he's too overpowered mm-hmm. what i say to that is that first off that's wrong because magic and brainiac you mm-hmm. know but second also um, power he's not like 
impenetrable. Like yep. Lobo almost killed him, and Lobo doesn't have magic, and Lobo doesn't have kryptonite. I'm just throwing that out there. Magic, he also kryptonite, punched him in the balls. Just throwing that out there. Dark side could beat yeah. up Superman. Like, Anyone that's powerful can go against him. So yeah, you just have to go to the DC cosmic threats. You can't have it be. You know, it can't be Joe like, Chill exactly, yeah. <laughs> versus Superman. Yeah. So, OK. Um, but the I, and so when people get hung up on that idea that you don't have anything that's a physical threat to Superman, and that's the way that the people want to write that. I say, OK, but there's a second idea to that. And Superman is an alien. He's from another planet. And Krypton is an authoritarian government, has been portrayed in a bunch of different places. Mm-hmm. So. There is this idea that Superman, nobody can hurt him. He's got this very staunch set of morality. And there is this idea of like, well, wouldn't things be better if I took over? Wouldn't (laughs) I be able to rule humanity better than anybody else out there? And that being like a a, a lure for Superman, a siren call to kind of speak to his own sense of morality. Now he's stopped because of, his because of his morality. morality but like i think that superman red sun works perfectly because mm-hmm. superman landed in russia and was adopted as a state hero was worshipped by the masses was raised by the government and when stalin dies mm-hmm. hands control of the soviet union over to superman who then uses because he's at the helm with the Kryptonian technology, yeah. he's able to spread communism across the entire world because there's a Superman behind it and not a, a, not a government that is fallible, right? Is that you've got this Kryptonian you yeah. know, wonder god behind it. And so I feel like that's an interesting thing because in that comic, Superman isn't a villain. He just thinks he's right. Mm-hmm. Like um, the Injustice Lords from Justice League Unlimited was a whole thing where they had – in another parallel reality, the Justice League was called the Justice Lords, and they actually ruled mankind. They didn't, like, help mankind. Yeah. And that triggered off a whole set of kind of the Amanda Waller, like, um, uh, the superhuman kind of, like, the anti-superhuman fail-safes in the government. And then mm-hmm. some of this, like, we're talking with Batman because he's technically on human- He's not super-powered and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. You've got things like Earth 2 where you've got Ultraman and Superwoman and Owlman who are, like, the evil versions of – who are actually literally the evil versions of the superheroes who run this corrupt world full of horrible shit. Like, the Flash in that world shoots up with Flash drugs. That's, like, how he gets his Flash yeah. powers. So there is a long tradition of – DC heroes turning bad and talking about like what if stories about what happens if they do turn bad. And I feel like that's fine. Yeah. And actually I feel like injustice two was such a good story because injustice one took a Superman is turned bad and him and Batman are now at odds kind of dark Knight style. And then super, and then injustice two mm-hmm. was took that to a further degree of like Brainiac shows up and none of us are powerful enough to stop him. And Superman's like, you need me. Yeah. And, but if you let him out of the cage to defend against it, like, so it created a more, an interesting story. And it had a bunch of different little factions, you know, you had the Superman faction and the Batman faction and like the weirdos and the villains and, you know, so I actually really like that story. Um, I'm not opposed to Superman being portrayed as evil and I don't even think he was portrayed as evil in, in the movie, in Batman versus Superman. He was. I didn't. I mean, I haven't seen it all the way through, but um, for reasons. Yeah. But um, I didn't think he was portrayed as evil. I thought it was more the perception of him was, like the, uh, the people outside of were thinking that he was evil. If right. that makes sense. It was more of him being manipulated. Yeah. The, you know, by the whole. I mean, it was. But it probably would have been easier to understand if it was written by somebody that. Uh, I, I'll be honest here. Batman versus Superman actually has, like, after thinking about it for a long time, has decent bones. It just needs a different, a different person to put the story together. It's uh, kinda like, I think the prequel trilogy of Star Wars have good bones. They're yeah. just not built the right way, right? Yeah. Um, so I do. Uh, and they, yeah. Uh, sorry. I was Go just going to say that he did also ask about how we feel about the Batman and the media, like being obsessed with Batman. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm a kind of. I So I was like a big, like, fuck Batman. I fucking hate Batman. Yeah. But whatever. Kind of over it. Um, they're doing interesting stuff with Batman right now. They're doing interesting stuff with Superman right now in comics. And um, I would love to spoil what happened, but no. I, don't, I don't know if people would be pissed off about it because be it's like off. a big thing. Yeah. Um, with Batman, but if it goes the way I think it's going, it'd be really interesting to see where he goes. Um, but they've been, uh, what's his name? 
uh, oh man, I can't remember his name. Everyone's gonna hate me, but uh, he did the Court of Owls stuff with Batman. He basically brought Batman down a few pegs. I want to say it's Snyder, like Scott Snyder. Uh huh. Um, but he with the Court of Owls brought Batman down from the oh I know everything. Oh I planned for this. Oh I knew this was gonna happen. Um, Scott Snyder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so Batman's already kind of been reverted back from the all powerful person that like is three steps ahead of you yeah. kind of thing. So he, he's already becoming a much more interesting character because they they kind of backtracked on all of that stuff where he's, he's been beaten and yeah. You know, I feel like Batman is that whole, like kind of Batman as as always knowing everything is a trope that is become a little bit overblown in its own right. Mm-hmm. Like if you go read the Grant Morrison justice league stuff, like Batman is a major character, but like when you think about it, Batman and Superman are like the two flagship characters of DC. So like, you know, what what are you going to do? Like depower Batman to the point where green lantern is always kicking his ass, right? Like you need it. Yeah. Batman needs to be quoting the world's greatest detective. He, he needs to be kind of planning. I feel like a lot of times you get this shit in like the, um, What's his a Frank Miller DK two right mm. where it's just like oh it's Batman and he's the best he's always the best but like in not a fan of Frank Miller no no there was I'm a, just there was a time I'm just throwing that out there there's a couple of Frank Miller books that are okay but like I uh, wasn't reading comics when Frank Miller was like hitting his prime was like sane <laughs> yeah was he sane though I mean he was pretty much making women whores from the get go Sin City works okay Sin City's not the only one that he made a woman a whore i know i know um, he was the one that made Catwoman a whore see that i didn't ever read any i mostly my sin city 300 ronin those were the only mm-hmm. books of his that i really dealt with but um but i don't know i mean i feel like batman's been written i mean the brian Azriello batman series was like that was the hundred bullets guy did a yeah. whole series of him as just like a detective comic that i feel like people focus a lot on that and i have too so i'm not immune to that but that there are plenty of good batman stories that don't have that where he's not just like i knew that i yeah. knew that too well i, I knew yeah. that too i mean yeah and then i also kind of have a mild uh issue with them overplaying the mental illness stuff yeah like i thought it was a really intriguing thing for his character to be like you know he's like he's still dealing with the depression of losing his family and yeah. like now these are all like he deals with all these other crazy people and he's just one of them and one way or another um which makes sense in its own way uh and i thought it was really intriguing but then a lot of people really grasped onto it and it's like i don't want like fucking psychotic batman like i just want they've done it a few too many times exactly yeah um i think the best thing is that batman's superpower is common sense over anything because all these superpowered people lose their common sense because they have superpowers and they don't think things through the same way as a normal person would in the uh in the rock of ages storyline that that was like the second or third uh i think it was yeah grant morrison run on jla there was actually a really great line where lex luthor had recreated the injustice gang and basically was running a corporate takeover on the justice league Mm -hmm. and batman was like he just he doesn't know that I'm also Bruce Wayne yeah, and that right. I know all about corporate takeover. So I actually really think that the bat that the Bruce Wayne Lex Luthor by way of Superman who knows that Bruce is Batman has yeah. a lot of interesting just like I love it when Lex and the Joker talk because they're so diametrically opposed. Yeah. Like, you know, Lex is like this rigid you know, running a, a CEO, you know, running a company and Joker's just like, ah, I got a warehouse. I filled it with hyenas. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I don't so. I, I think uh, with all the hate for Batman, it's still important to point out that uh, he's had a lot of really shitty stories. Sure. But he's had a real high percentage of great stories. Sure. So, I yeah. mean, you can be mad, but he's fine. I mean, it, it's annoying when people start, like, shoving him in your face all the time. But I honestly think he's... he At this point, I think we're a little past that. Yeah. And we're kind of coming down off of that. I think so, too. So. But actually, this is a pretty decent segue. I don't even normally do this for questions. Into our next question from... Why is Batman the best? Um, Marikas, who says, Dear Jeff... And Marika says, amazingly psychotic co-host. Um, How did he know? I don't know. Marika's here. Uh, just wanted to get this question off my chest. Uh, in the last six to seven years, I've noticed 
The majority of people have gotten more cynical and negative about everything to the point uh, that being happy or optimistic means you're a child. And the belief and the belief that you don't want everything dark and broody or, quote, realistic means that you like and I quote kitty shit. Don't get me wrong. I like dark entertainment, too. I just don't think everything should be dark. Was I just too young to notice before or has the world gotten more cynical recently? Keep up the good work. Marikas. I think the world has always been the cynical, but, uh, and I'm, I hate, <laughs> which, you know, to hate Are you going to be real cynical I'm about this? I'm going to be cynical about this. <laughs> you be real cynical about I, this. I don't like when, uh, people make this complaint about the internet mm. because I think it's, it comes off like an old person getting mad at somebody standing on their lawn. But, uh, I do feel like the internet is a big reason why it seems like people are more cynical sure. because their voices are out there more yep. as opposed to like... I would say I didn't like this movie and I talked to like 10 of my friends and 10 of my friends would disagree or like five of my friends would disagree. And that's, th that would be the end of the conversation. Now I could literally project it out to the world and then the world could project something else back to me. Um, and that's why it seems like we're more cynical. I, I feel like um, a lot of the, you only like dark and edgy shit or it has to be realistic and whatever is more of a marketing issue. It's, it's more of like what Hollywood is trying to sell to us uh -huh. than what people actually feel as somebody who follows a bunch of, uh, Muppet fan blogs. I can tell you that people still like kitty shit Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing unadult about it. And like, I mean, I might be the wrong person to ask because I've worked in a comic book shop. I make puppets every once in a while. Yeah. Like I'm, all about super brightly colored whimsical things a mm. lot of times and also really into horror movies see the, and you see the know. trailer for the new disney the new pixar movie Coco? yeah yes looks good yeah i'm gonna watch the fuck out of that <laughs> um i i i largely agree with you um i think that um Marikas, I think that one of the things that you have to remember, I think that one of the things that we all have to remember even me i have to even me and my infinite yeah, wisdom Jeff, maybe you should remember it I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> is that um, the the quote examples that we have of like people being negative mm -hmm. are it's real hard to uh, there's a um, God, what do they call it it's a sampling error mm -hmm. right is that let's say that uh, let's pick a thing um, did you just want to do like Batman Batman yeah okay uh, BuzzFeed writes an article um, twenty reasons why. Batman is the worst superhero of all time. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the comment section and there's just like, there's like 95 comments of people just like, this is the worst list I've ever seen. You're full of shit. You're cherry picking, blah, 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 blah. What about this? You're stupid, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. You got to remember that's 95 out of how many people are there on earth? Like a uh, bunch, several billion, I believe at least 4,000. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's see, uh, earth population. I'm going to type this into the internet. <laughs> oh, look at Google help us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's just say that, um, maybe it says seven, seven point three, four, seven billion. Yeah. Okay. Let's say that, let's say, uh, that 10% of everybody on earth has the internet uh -huh. let's just say that that's way low right that means that you're still talking about a sample size of 734 million people so let's say that you can find 200,000 shitty racist tweets and that the other 734 33 million yeah uh 800,000 people yeah didn't make a shitty racist tweet it means that there's a problem that you got to look at or you know you want to you want to talk about that you don't want to pretend it doesn't exist but you also aren't like you never are able to see the people that read that article and they were like eh, yeah i think Batman is a little unpowered and then they just fucking went on with their day yeah is that it seems like your comment section is this overwhelming tidal wave of argument it's yeah but it, you never see the people who just don't even care to go in there it's right? just a, a, an odd focus on the negative and this might take it a little dark but um there was oh, dark and gritty realistic kind of well no like <laughs> real life sad shit but there was a stabbing on a subway recently okay like, a muslim girl was being harassed by a guy and three people told yes. told him to back the fuck down and he pulled out a knife and started stabbing him and he killed two guys and the other ones in the hospital um 
and everyone talked about the guy. Everyone yeah. talked about the guy stabbing everybody. Mm-hmm. Oh, not a lot of people talked about three other people standing up and stopping that guy from harassing somebody. Right. And it's just like, if you just think about that, not even including the people that like helped the girl, the medic that, that was on the subway, um, that helped the people, the victims uh, that got stabbed. Like there were other people that also helped, but um, people only talked about the one guy and how horrible this one guy is. They didn't talk about how the entire subway reacted and it was a large group of people that did something to stand against that. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, that's kind of what happens. Like, that's a much more extreme version of it because, you know, some most of the time it's just about shitty opinions about movies or whatever. Right. But, I mean, it's the same idea is that, like, four people will be like, this is fucking dumb, and then all of a sudden everyone kind of goes, well, people are saying... I. It's it, it's the idea like when people are like oh man that the Wonder Woman uh, is only sc- I, yeah. screening and like Twitter is freaking out and they show you like sixty quotes of garbage people on Twitter being like blah 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 yeah it's like okay remember I you know what I just want uh, Maricus I want you and I want everybody else who listens to this to remember this number at all times and every 7. day seven point three four seven billion with a B yeah that's seven with six zeros behind it (laughs) yeah okay like any time that you see four people on facebook being shitty and every and that's why i say i need to remember it too anytime you see one person you disagree with in the comment section anytime somebody on facebook is getting under your skin or somebody on twitter is being a jerk off for fucking the person is saying whatever remember that there are over seven billion people on this planet and that 50 tweets is literally nothing yeah. it literally represents a zero percent sample size yeah. to whatever now you can argue that like well those people represent more people that are behind them and blah 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 blah. but seven billion with a b it's a big number you, you, yeah and you can't just assume that everyone that's being verbal is the only opinion just because they're the only ones talking doesn't mean yeah. they're the only opinion now as far as media goes um I've talked about this before. I talked about it a lot with Grant on one of our Patreon um, segments. Mm-hmm. I feel like the dark, gritty media portrayal is a shorthand to cover up your bad writing or, or the hard work of more complicated writing to make your character. Explaining how a character is an adult grown up yeah. takes time. Being show, visually showing dark, you know, things with dramatic consequences and shocking actions and brutal violence like yeah. is a very quick shorthand to get there it doesn't always mean that it works i mean or it doesn't always mean that it works but it doesn't also mean that it doesn't work like i think that the dark tone of batman versus superman doesn't entirely work for me because this is a different i, I have a different idea of those characters yeah but john wick is a really dark movie and it works perfectly john wick starts with the guy killing his dog and then he fucking just brutally shoots a hundred people, and I fucking love it. Yeah, like, we were like, so yeah, no, I could <laughs> easily understand why he would shoot a hundred people. Yeah, it was an adorable dog. A Nightmare on Elms or the uh, horror movies have been in a dark, dark place for a long ass time. Yeah, you know. Um, I feel like I always thought dark and edgy was uh left behind of the nineties because that's kind of when it started or really got into it. I mean, that's when you got like Spawn and shit. Um, where you started getting these care. I understand like they didn't look that way because the aesthetic in the nineties was kind of different, but you have to think about the fact that movies nowadays, like they talk about dark and gritty. They talk about edgy, but they also actively seek PG 13. Okay. Allow me to, to make a, a no, bit of a please, retort go for it. because when I was reading Grant Morrison's super gods, mm-hmm. when he was talking about stuff, remember that, um, Okay, let me make sure I got my... Let's go back to our favorite character of this podcast. You ready? Batman. We're back to Batman. Batman. So remember that Batman's first appearance was in Detective Comics number 27 uh, in March of 1939. Wow. How did you just come up with that date just off the top of your head, Jeff? It's called My Brain is the Best. (laughs) 7.347 billion (laughs) brain cells in my brain. Okay, now remember that the comics were very new, and then think about Batman. Mm -hmm. This is an unpowered, in an era where they're basically we're creating new American gods, not to rip off the series, but like Superman's a Greek god running around a comic book, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Think of 
Batman, a, a, a man whose parents were murdered, who goes out and fights against psychotic clowns and like people, you know, mute like a pang, a deformed was penguin man. Was he going man. after psychotic clowns in 1939 though, or was he going after like? I think it was like the, the eighth or ninth. Dick Tracy style villains and shit like that. It was created as a dark. As a, it was created like exactly what we're talking about. It was mm-hmm. created as like a dark alternative comic where this is, I mean, it was the fact that it was in detective comics yeah. was that it was this dark brooding character that was like the opposite of Superman's appeal as a very light, you know, the Simon and Schuster's very light, like godlike characters. Here you had a man who goes out at night. Also, just to think about the way that in 1939, just society was different. A man who prowls the night looking for criminals, who is looking to scare criminals. You're yeah. like, this is the very antithetical to the way that things were around that time. Mm-hmm. You know, the vigilante operating above the law who is facing down these fucking crazy villains. Like the, the Batman's rogues gallery is just fucking nuts, man. Yeah. So I actually think that this concept has been around for a long time. Well, I mean, the seventies was full of dark and gritty too, but I, you know what I mean? Like the 1940s it, it, pulp novels of, yeah. you know, the dame walks into a smoky bar. Raymond Chandler was dark and gritty at the time, you know, that, yeah. that stuff happened, but but I think the the kind of dark and gritty that they're selling to people now, they're selling to us now, is a product of the 90s. I think it's a product of the 90s and the early 2000s. I think it's that leftover um, idea that dark and edgy is adult. Yeah. And that was how they appealed to adult audiences. I mean, I, I'm sure, I guess, they, they weren't exactly appealing to young audiences in the 70s with their fucking... Uh, exploitation did, films and dirt, like or that, dirt, but, like Dirty Harry, like that's yeah, not for that's like kids, a very but adult. Movie. It just felt like a kind of weird cartoonish way of doing, it. like because it, it, that dark and edgy that they're selling that they cl- claim is more realistic isn't realistic. Yeah, it's it's not. It's just uh, overdone. It's just not right. I don't know. It just feels like I guess because I grew up in the nineties that it feels like what it was in the nineties, um, except that they go they. See, roll get, back on the uh, a lot of it because they want that PG-13. Sure. I think that I I understand I I think I understand what you're saying. The the type of thing that you're saying definitely kind of came to fruition and got like polished up into a formula in the 90s. Well, it just feels like a facade. It's like a it's like a paint over something. Sure. To just be like it's like they took a gray filter and just put it over a movie and was like, it's an adult movie. Yeah. So they didn't have to actually put extra work into a story or characters. I feel like that's been around in different forms in other places, but it's, yeah, that's I, I understand what yeah. you're saying is I feel like what we have today, you can probably point directly to the nineties and you, you have stuff that looks very similar. So it's almost like you can track that stylistic movement mm-hmm. to probably starting in the nineties, but just as a general concept of being dark. I mean, I feel like that's the reason why you know, the Sergio Leone spaghetti Westerns were really popular. And hell, my dad always used to tell me it was one of the reasons that star Wars was popular because star Wars was dirty. Mm-hmm. Like the things in star Wars were dirty. dirty. Yeah. And gritty. Have, and like, I don't you know, know how many, um, like star Wars ripoff movies that came out like two years after star Wars mm-hmm. you watch, but it's, oddly jarring how clean everybody is yeah <laughs> like where they'll be like straight up like crisp white outfit and you're like what like or Star Luke trek like, yeah. trek before that was was very clean right yeah, very much so um i mean you know sometimes kirk will roll around in the dirt and get his shirt like, ripped yeah but... you like rip so you can see the one nipple <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... i liked those episodes <laughs> anyway let's we're already <laughs> way over this so I'm let's sorry um Let's see. I'm going to skip this one because it's real long. Ian, I'm sorry. Send it in next week and I'll play it again. Or I'll, I'll play it again. again. Play it again. Play the hits. Um, this one's just a picture of somebody's balls. <laughs> Patty Howe, uh, <laughs> uh, or Patty who, or Patty somebody, writes in and says, Hello, Rage Buddies. A Bubsy sequel just got announced, and without an ounce of irony, I'm super excited about it. I'm so sorry, Patty, for <laughs> spending 10 minutes just shitting on Bubsy's face. <laughs> Uh, so what obscure defunct gaming mascot character would you like to see make a comeback? Oh, fuck. I would slap a stranger's baby for a 2D gex. I feel like I just slap a stranger's crapped on all the, no, I I know, I like that though. Like just uh, the image of them like whacking a small child. Yeah. Also, Jeff, I finally got good and I'm making solid progress through Demon Souls. I bought it when it first came out. So yeah. 
Uh, all the best, Patty How or who or something. So are you gonna just shit all over Patty's opinions on games now? Yeah, Patty, you should restart uh, Demon Souls and play as a <laughs> royal or a noble, whichever one it's called. They're like the easy mode for Demon Souls. If it's your first time, you know, there's no shame playing on easy mode. Um, uh, no, there are other long dead 2D characters that I feel like I'd like to, or older characters. I can't I'd like even to, think of any. I got one. Uh huh. Earthworm Jim. Oh my God! I, I can't believe love... I didn't even think about Earthworm and Jim. Yeah, he was great. Uh, in spite of crapping on it earlier, I think that James Pond or, or, or the was probably one of the best. Like a little fish dressed up in a tuxedo. I don't remember doing that. Some super spy At stuff. All. It sounds like you made it up. No, I swear. Here, let me show it you. It sounds a like of an it. alternate dimension thing where, like, no. you remember it, and nobody else does. Nope. Um, Nope, right there. Boom. He was a fish and he had a little little gun and he was tr- he's like a James Bond fish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this doesn't make me feel like it's not fake. It looks more fake than anything else. <laughs> underwater agent. What the fuck? Is yeah, here's the thing. This is an old like Genesis game, I believe. Um Wow. Uh I can honestly say without any real um um blah, 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 uh, hyperbole that uh i really wish that they would bring back jack and daxter because i like jack and daxter a lot and they've made roughly one billion wretch and clank games which i like but they haven't bothered to do any jack and daxter and i really 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 like jack but what and if they fuck it up well then to fuck with naughty dog who made uncharted and the last of us and uh, you know whatever that other one is um toe jam and earl I could deal with some toe jam and roll back in my life. Um, I'm trying to think of some other mascot driven games. There's Booger Man, a pick and flick adventure on the <laughs> Genesis. I'm serious. That's a thing. Yeah, I don't doubt it. I'm trying. I don't know why I don't know most of these. It's not like I wasn't like into games during this time. Yeah. I mean, just, like anything that looked like it was too cartoony. I was like, no, nah, I want that dark and gritty shit. That's right, because you were you were really into that dark and gritty yeah. shit, yeah. Um, all your uh, you're looking for lists, and all the lists are Mario. <laughs> yeah, Mario, Sonic, Pac Man, Bubsy, Link, Conquer, Angry Birds, Lolo. That'd be an interesting one to see a new Lolo game. The old one, this Crash Bandicoot. I feel like a lot of these are so entwined with the time they came out that it'd be kind of weird to bring them back. Glover. <laughs> oh yeah, Glover was weird. Um, let's see. Because I like, I don't understand how you would do another Conquerors game. Uh, what does Conquer die at the end of Conquerors Bad Fur Day or something? Or? No, I just mean that he just feels like of his time. Hmm. Where it's like stupid, I don't know, married with children humor, if that makes sense. Oh, man. Bring back Space Ace. That was an awesome game. Um, There's Gex. So I'll be honest, to be brutally frank about it, I don't really have a connection to any video game mascot. Mario is probably the closest one. What about that one with the Pepsi logo? Do you know what I'm talking about? The little dot, the little red dot? Or is that Sprite? The just the red dot with the glasses, yeah. The Seven Up Cool Spot, yeah. That's what yeah. it was. What about that game? Why don't they do another Seven Up Cool Spot game? And the Noid and like the Lucky Charms. And <laughs> Did like... the California Raisins ever have a game? Oh, I'm I'm almost. I used to be all about the California Raisins. I am. I'm gonna look this up, but I am almost certain that there was a California Raisins um, NES game because, of course, there was. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, shit. Burger King's Burger King had like four different video games. Yep. Uh, yep. Range, the Grape Escape. The Grape Escape. <laughs> yep, there it is. Made by Capcom, no less. Nice. Oh, wait. Published by Capcom, developed by some garbage people. Yay, uh, garbage. You know, you could make a, you could get 6,000 hits on YouTube by playing all the way through California Raisins, The Grape Escape in eight minutes and 57 seconds with no deaths. Do you remember, man, I got to tell you, 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 you ladies and gentlemen at home, you people who are younger than we are, like there was a time when we were all about the California raisins. Yeah. Like there was yeah. little claymation raisins, and they just oh, sang. They sang Motown. Yeah, it was great. Mostly yeah. just to heard it through the grapevine. Yeah, just mostly that one song. But it was good. It was pretty fun. I liked it. 
this is a really strange. We're watching a video of what um, did they sell? Were they literally just raisins? Yeah, like, they were like they the were California. Ch- you know what's funny? They, I loved the California raisins. I hate raisins. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, they were on like the national. They were like the California like Grape Council or something yeah. like that. Like the raisin, trying to get kids to eat raisins. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, now. I'm just mesmerized by this game. <laughs> yeah, I gotta turn this off. Um, yeah, I've got to say that uh, I don't really care. I don't have enough of a connection to. I care. Any... I want the California Raisins back. Are you kidding me? California Raisins game. That's yeah. your answer to any of those games. T and C Surf Design. You remember there was a cat in a business suit and he was riding a skateboard. <laughs> no, but that sounds amazing. Um, as long as it's a good game, I don't care. Yeah. If that Bubsy game that we looked at earlier looked like a good game, if it looked we, like We thought Rayman, we'd throw you guys off by putting the shitty gameplay in the trailer. <laughs> right, you know, but it looked like a real crappy piece of crap. Like, you know, I Rayman isn't dramatically different in structure from what we saw there, but, like, Rayman just cuts a way better, like, at it, like it, when you look at it, it looks better, it moves faster, and yeah. it's just kind of like, eh. So. Rayman is wonderful. That... Rayman Legends was my favorite game that came out that year. Oh wait, I've, I'm I'm wrong. It's a uh, Bonk uh, from Bonk's Adventure, Bonk. Caveman with a Giant Nose. That's oh yeah, the... I actually remember that one. Or Master Hudson from Hudson's Adventure Island. So that one I don't remember. Our last question last comes in window. from I'm going to say R says, "Hey Jeff and Amanda, wondering your thoughts on this." Um, and this is a, an article he sent me. Cowboy Bebop being remade as a live action TV series. I'd be all down for a live action series, but I'm hesitant with the production crew tasked with it. So, who's the production crew? I don't know. Let's find out. I haven't read this article yet. Three point seven point three four seven billion <laughs> um, is in development for American Television at Tomorrow Studios. What a- uh, Tomorrow Studios, a partnership between ITV Studios and television producer Marty. Adelstein from Teen Wolf, Aquarius, and Prison Break, Prison Break Resurrection fame is teaming up with Sunrise, the Japanese animation studio behind Cowboy Bebop, and Midnight Radio to produce a live-action series according to Variety and Deadline. Christopher Yost, the screenwriter behind Thor The Dark World, and the upcoming Thor Ragnarok is on board to write the remake. So let's just take a quick look at Tomorrow Studios and see if they actually have like a... They've got like a IMDB page. Um, Snowpiercer... Like a bunch of movies all called Good Behavior. Good Behavior from Terrible Me. Good Behavior. Your Mama Had a Hard Night. I'm not making this up. Good Behavior. Beautiful Things Deserve Beautiful Things. Good Behavior. We Pretend We're Stuck. Good Behavior. The Ballad of Little Santino. Good Behavior. (laughs) It Still Fits, Bitch. (laughs) Are these all episodes of a TV show? They might be. Oh, man. Good Behavior. Oh, okay. Um weird yeah that's a tv show it's uh michelle dockery letty rains is a thief and a con artist whose life is always uh whose life is always one wrong turn one bad decision from implosion which is just how she likes it fresh out of prison she's attempting to stay afloat but when she overhears a hitman being hired to kill a man's wife she sets out to derail the job sending her on a wild collision course with the charming killer and entangling them in a dangerous seductive relationship is it a porn? Nope. It's Michelle Dockery and Juan Diego Bato. Would I know who Michelle Dockery is? Let's see. That's her. She was in Hannah. Uh-uh. She was in Downton Abbey. Uh-uh. She was in Self Slash Less. Uh-uh. She was in Angie Tribeca. She was in uh, Family Guy as British woman in <laughs> Boopity Boppity. <laughs> She was the narrator in American Dad, National Treasure 4, Baby Franny. She's doing well. The whole story. Uh, now you're just reading, like, random I'm people. just going to read Wikipedia. She was Gemma Morrison in The Walking Dead, two episodes. I don't watch The Walking Dead. She was in Dalziel and Pasco, the TV series, as Amy Hobbs in Project Aphrodite, part one and part two. Does it ever amaze you? Like, this goes back to the 3.47 or the 7.34 billion people thing. Mm-hmm. Does it ever amaze you the number of TV shows you just never heard of or watched ever in your entire life? Yes, all the time. Like, Good Behavior or... Do you think the TV dudes talk about Good Behavior? I don't... Probably not. I'm going to ask him. Here's the TV movie in 2009 called Red Riding, the year of our Lord, 1983. And its sequel? 
Red Riding, The Year of Our Lord, 1974, that came out the same year. How about The Courageous Heart of Irina Sendler or Cranford or <laughs> The Turn of the Screw <laughs> or Cranford <laughs> or Spoiler as Goth Girl. Nice. Um, anyway, so enough of that. Uh, <laughs> are we being, are we, um, so are you, do you, do you ever watch Cowboy Bebop, the old show? Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. What do you think about making a TV series out of Cowboy Bebop? I think it makes sense. I mean, it was popular enough that that audience will w- want to watch it, and it's a good enough story that if done properly, it would be a great thing. I would hope that they'd have enough money because I think that the projection would cost an arm and a leg. Um, yeah. I mean, if they really want to do it good, it should cost them an arm and a leg. Um, it depends on, I mean, like you could do, there's a lot of episodes that don't involve you could take some of the ship stuff out of a lot of the episodes. Yeah, but, but I mean, it's really nice for the world to have it, Yeah, I think. And once you start, like, going from set piece to set piece instead of giving you some of those, like, digital shots of spaceships and stuff like that. Sure. You, you kind of lose a little bit of something. Um, I think it'd be good. I'm, I'd be interested in their casting more than their who the production people behind it because you're not going to, like, lose me with some the company that does Teen Wolf. I... I that was a popular show. I yeah. know a lot of people that love that show. I've never seen an episode, so I can't judge it. And I love the actors in Prison Break. So um, that's not a deterrent for me either. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, it really, to me, depends on casting and who they get as a showrunner more than who's putting fronting the money for it. Okay. Uh, I think it's a terrible idea. Um <laughs> I think that anime doesn't ever translate well to the big screen. It I think matter somebody's got to fucking prove that wrong. I there think, has to be a point. I think that there's a reason why it doesn't translate well, and it's because animation and live action aren't the same thing. They don't have the same aesthetic. It's like uh, video games and movies. It's like books and TV shows. It's like a lot of things. Some things you can do right, but like the for a TV show, unless that was like one hell of a well-funded HBO show, yeah. I don't think they're going to have the budget just to do things like camera moves, wire work, mm-hmm. and to make it. Because the problem the problem is, let's take the very first episode of um, Cowboy Bebop, right? Mm-hmm. The um, Tijuana Blues or whatever it's called. Um, was it the Real Folk Blues? That's the name of the song. Um, anyway. Also, they're going to have to spend a lot of money on music because Cowboy Bebop had amazing soundtrack. Yeah, that's all Yoko Kano. Um, so, Ow. Uh, I just hit the microphone with your teeth. No, with my water, and then I smacked it, my water into the microphone, and the microphone into my face. Okay, so Cowboy what about Bebop, Samurai Champloo instead. No, I don't like then, Samurai Champloo. Woo! That's just me. How dare you? It's, you're welcome to like what you want to like. No, you have to like it. <laughs> Enjoy um, it now. <laughs> Asteroid Blues, first uh-huh. episode, right? Yeah. Um, to me. There's that awesome fight scene between the guy and Spike when he's got the little vial, right? And mm-hmm. He's backing up and he's kind of going over all the stuff, right? Yeah. And the whole Tijuana thing. If you can't make that work, then it doesn't work. I don't know. There's just a stylistic freedom to animation that when you try to replicate it in real life, I, I think that you probably could make Cowboy Bebop into a thing. It would just need to be... I think its plot really lends itself to anything. Like, it doesn't have to just be anime. I think the look and feel that we get from it is all because of the animation. But I don't know... You know what I wish they would do? Yeah. I wish they'd just take the idea and then write their own series. Yeah. Like, write it like a Firefly series where you build the ship, right? And then you film the planets and just put, like... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do twelve episodes and just cancel the fuck out of it. No, but like build the ship, build the ship interiors, right? You got a CGI ship. Yeah. Then shoot the other stuff out there in California, in Southern California. But how do you know and, they're not going to do that? And put CGI. That they're just going to do a uh, cowboy bebop like that, or is the? Do oh, I don't, I don't. Uh, but I have a feeling that the, the when they try to cash in on stuff like this, they're going to want to do the Spike vicious. Fay jet black the kind of whole thing right yeah because that's what people from the comic or from the um anime really liked i don't want to see that again i've already seen it i i fucking like wept at the end of it's not for you though when they do live action stuff like this i mean it'll get people that are fans to watch yeah the first few episodes or really to watch to see what they do different but 
when they do stuff like this, it tends to be like, hey, we took this thing nerds liked and then we kind of dumbed it down for you guys. Yeah, which, but I don't know that, like, I'm trying to think of in the West an anime adaptation that's actually worked, that has made any amount of money and been considered at all successful. They've been talking live action Akira as long as I've been alive, like, oh, yeah. since I was like 14, right? Um, Why have we never gotten an, a live action Sailor Moon movie? Is that because weird? the company because... that makes Sailor Moon doesn't want to like make what well, actually there might be live action Sailor Moon movies in Japan. I mean, like Japan already had like four Death Note movies. Yeah, and those were super successful, weren't they? Uh, I think so. I think in Japan they were. Um, but you think about the animes that everybody knows. You think about the here's Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, a Japanese television series that ran from 2003 to 2004. Um, I just I got it. What we need is uh, live action samurai pizza cats <laughs> with actual like with just cats in suits, <laughs> body armor. So here's your eating s- pizza. Here's your oh. live action Samu- Sailor Moon transformation sequence from the 2003 series. Yeah, that looks 2003 ish. But I, I don't I don't know. I just don't think. Yeah, it can't look like they're cosplaying. Like, that's a big thing for me is that when, like, for some reason, Japanese shows always kind of look like they're cosplaying. <laughs> like, it's just, it's not like they didn't put any more production to it. It's basic and standard. What the fuck? <laughs> so we're watching the transformation and Mercury went from, like, a nerd chick to, like, and now I have different hair. Yeah. A wig. <laughs> um, I just don't think that, I don't think they'd put enough... So for my money, the reason that I get all uptight about this is because I feel like the amount of money they need to put in to make it look right yeah. makes studios really nervous. And so they're not going to just let it go to a, a – like Ghost in the Shell, for all intents and purposes, from the trailer looked right. But uh, then I heard that the story wasn't really all that great, right? Yeah. So. I just don't know if I you're able to do both. I really appreciated that they apparently – like only westerners were or like americans were upset about the casting oh, this is Scarlett Johansson, and yeah. then everyone else is like i don't understand why you guys are so upset about this <laughs> yeah <laughs> um i'm sorry but these transformations <laughs> are like just, i can't look away <laughs> they're I'm so to crazy talk. they're so crazy so we're gonna wrap this up <laughs> thanks everybody for listening mail at rage like that com is the email address uh make sure to tune in starting today um, but you know, Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be trying to live stream some E3 stuff. Mostly just, we're going to be, pull, we're going to be ripping off somebody else's stream and I'm just going to be hanging out in the chat. So if you want to come hang out with me and watch E3, I'm going to be watching it. So, you know, um, come hang out and let's, uh, let's do an E3. Let us know in the comment section, what you, what's your favorite thing that you think is going to happen at E3 this year is, uh, and with that, <laughs> this is so, <laughs> you guys have to search live action 2003 sailor moon transformation do it right now <laughs> and watch it you will not be you're, t- you're gonna love it it's amazing <laughs>